Um, so welcome to React uh, at Penn 2019. I'm Russ Composto uh, from the Engineering School. I'm the PI of React. React, if you don't know it, stands for Research and Education uh, for Active Coding Technologies. And what React does, it brings together over 30 scientists from the United States and France uh, to work on um, energy, health, water-related issues, particularly coatings, that could be applied to shelters that are required after a natural disaster. So that's sort of our umbrella. But at the heart of it, we're basic scientists. And one of the goals of today is to kind of look at bridging the policy, technology, basic science divide. Um, a little bit more about REACT. It's funded by a five-year NSF grant, um, and it supports international research collaborations between scientists with complementary expertise and complementary facilities. There's facilities in France, for example, that we don't have access to in the United States. And most importantly, it supports undergraduate, graduate, and postdoctoral student researchers in an international environment. Our international partners are from Grenoble, France, and uh, the PI uh, from that group, Patrice Renault, will say a, a few words in a minute. Um, Salve a multinational company with research centers near Philadelphia and not too far from Grenoble is our industrial partner and importantly the sponsor of the symposium this afternoon. And we also have new colleagues that we've invited from South Korea that are attending the symposium and over the next two days they're going to work with us and the French group on a energy water workshop that's being organized by Professor Zara Fakra from chemistry over the next few days. So we're always looking ahead and building on React. React is our foundation, and then we're continually hungry to leverage what React could provide. So we're looking forward to bringing in our South Korean partners over the next few days. So with that, I'll ask Patrice to say a few words. Thank you, Russ. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrice Ranou, so I'm a CNRS Director of Research. And uh, I have the pleasure to serve as the PI of the French partner, which is called GIANT. So if you don't know what is GIANT, it's one of the many acronyms that we like to have in the French system. Go on the, on the website, Grenoble GIANT, and you will see more. I'm representing here a 20 PI on the French side, so you know here, you know, everybody uh, on the Penn side, but there's also French uh, people on the, in, the, in this program. And, uh, of course, we have uh, many bodies we are, who are supporting us. Uh, the French National Agency of Research, CNRS, Atomic Energy and Alternative Energy Commission, the University Grenoble Lab, uh, Grenoble Institute of Technologies, uh, Institute La Hollande, and many of them. And, but uh, because I'm here to... Uh, to represent France, I should say a few words about our U.S. partner. You know, it's like a family we have here. It's my first time. It's my second home. And nothing would have been possible without the constant support from the University of Pennsylvania. I, I, I can recognize many faces here I've seen in the past, and it's a, it's a great pleasure. So our product is maybe science, but it's also the young generation. And so that's, uh, that's what you will, uh, you will see in the... In the, next, um, in the next years to come, I, I would say some of these people, we have a, a React line on it, and that will be our pride. So with that, I thank you very much. And again, on behalf of all my colleagues from the French side, uh, I hope you will enjoy this, uh, this afternoon. And of course, we try to mirror, uh, I would say, the level of uh, professionalism and excellency we have in, uh, we have in, in Philadelphia here all in, in January. And so we have also a, a kind of event like this in, uh, in June, and you most uh, then welcome if you happen to come to, uh, to Europe and stop by in Grenoble. There will be React Friend and Pen Friend all over the place. Thank you. Thank you. So before we begin the uh, symposium itself, we have uh, two distinguished guests to provide some opening remarks to our symposium. Um, now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Provost Wendell Pritchard, Penn's Chief Academic Officer, and in some way he's my boss too, because my other hat is as an Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education, so we work together on education. Um, uh, Wendell's also Presidential Professor in the Penn Law School and uh, the Graduate School of Education. His scholarly work has focused on urban history and policy with an emphasis on housing, race relations, and economic development. 
Uh, he's extremely busy. We're very thankful that he's been generous with our his time to talk a little bit about his vision of sustainability and energy and what he's thinking about at the University of Pennsylvania. So please join me in welcoming uh, Wendell Pritchard. Good afternoon, everybody. So I, it's a pleasure to welcome you here, and I have the honor of welcoming lots of different groups uh, through my job. And lots of the meetings, not all of them, are, are in this room. And I got to tell you, there's a diversity of atmospheres in this room that I've, I've experienced. And when I walked in here, I said, boy, this is a serious group that's ready to get to work. Um, so I'm going to be brief, because I can tell that you're ready to get to work. Um, but I did want to just stop by for a minute and say thank you um, and, and welcome you. We're really honored to host you, um, not only because we can show off this wonderful space and also the Singh Center for Nanotechnology, which if you haven't seen, you're going to get to see soon. And it's just a fabulous building, um, and I'm uh, happy that you're going to get to experience that. Um, I also want to welcome our colleagues from France and from Korea. I understand we have colleagues from both um, and offer you our warm hospitality, if not the warmth of this um, time of year. Sorry, we can't offer that, but our warm hospitality we can promise. Um, so I also want to acknowledge Russ and Zara and their team and thank them uh, uh, and our partner institutions for all of the work that they've done on this important project, but also just for pulling everybody together in January. Um, it's a tremendous and innovative project. Uh, so let's join, uh, thank Russ and Zara. So as Russ mentioned, I'm a professor of law, uh, not an engineer, though I feel like I've started to learn through Russ um, a, a little bit about engineering. Um, but I promise you I'm not going to be talking about bacteria detection in plasmonic microcapsules. Um, that is not one of my fields. Um, I think there are going to be some other people doing that. But I do know the following. I do know that research into active coatings and polymers, the work that you all do, has limitless potential to create products that will improve global health and welfare and the human habitat on a massive scale. And again, I've been educated by Russ and his colleagues about this, and it is really impressive, the work that you're doing. So clearly, this is an emerging field, um, and we're just scratching the surface. Yes, pun, scratching the surface. Come on, you can groan. Um, of what can be accomplished on a technical level. Um, but for a research university like ours, um, these advances are a perfect example of the real-world benefits that accrue from the work done in our labs and classrooms by our faculty and our students. And again, I want to thank you all for that, that work. Um, so as Russ mentioned, I'm going to very briefly, because I want you to get to work, uh, talk a little bit about Penn's approach to these challenges and research more generally, which I have the pleasure of supervising as the provost. So when we talk about the human habitat, we're talking not about one thing, obviously. We're talking about a lot of things, and I'm only just going to mention a couple of them. Uh, countless codependent systems, air, water, food, energy, and the climate. Biodiversity, health and disease vectors, the built environment, something I think I know a little bit about, um, and so on. Um, and the challenges that we face are connected in ways that we're just beginning to understand. That's one of the things that you're focused on. And in ways that we still can't even imagine, though we're starting to get even more scared at all of the ways that we, they are connected and the things that we're starting to understand. Now, solving these problems uh, involves and requires input from a broad array of disciplines. Um, so I'm biased. I'm the provost of the University of Pennsylvania. But I truly believe that Penn is unique among the world's great universities for the following reason. Our focus on interdisciplinary education and research is supported and driven by the proximity of all of our schools. That's something that really is special uh, at Penn as a large institution. They're all like, located right here on this campus, very close together. Um, and this really gives us an unparalleled opportunity to collaborate. Um, and we have lots of formal collaborations. One of them is React. Um, but we have even more un informal collaborations among faculty, uh, between faculty and students, and um, between faculty and the community that are advancing this work. And I really do think we're privileged to be able to do that kind of work, the informal um, collaborations that ge generate the new ideas. Um, so relevant to React um, in, in engineering, and I think many of you know this, but not all of you, in bio and nanotechnology and material science and in chemistry and physics, we have not just the advanced programs, uh, but most importantly, the people um, who are doing cutting edge research that drives discovery. Um, and even beyond the hard sciences, our research vision is holistic. Um, it includes energy policy through our Climate Center for Energy. Um, and I know that Mark, who's sitting right up the front row, Mark Hughes, is going to be discussing that work and how it intersects with so many of the things 
uh, that you do here. But not only that, it includes sustainable design through our School of Design, it includes climate change through the Wharton School's Initiative for Global Env Environmental Leadership and its Risk Management Center, among other activities. Um, and it's important to note, uh, as I start to wind down, that we do practice what we preach. Penn has been recognized as a leader in climate action for many years. For, an exa for example, in 2007, uh, we were the first university in the nation to sign the president's climate commitment, um, and our climate action plan has become a model for other action, uh, academic institutions around the world. In fact, we recently just updated, though we're already in the process of updating it yet again, because we learn more every day. And it goes without saying, though I'll say it, um, that our partnerships with other universities, the nonprofit sector, and the pri and private industry represented here and other places are critical to the work that we do and the work that you do. So we really truly couldn't do it without all of these partnerships. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of you and all of the work that you do with us. So final disclosure as I wrap up, um, this is the first week of the semester, I guess you probably guessed that, and so there are a lot of things going on. So unfortunately, I can't spend uh, time with you learning even more about the important work that you do, but I know this is gonna be a great conference and I really appreciate all the time uh, that you've spent uh, with us and more importantly, doing all of the work that you do. And I look forward to getting a great report from Russ and Zara and others uh, about your work. Thank you. So since uh, React began three years ago, we've had wonderful support from Penn Global from the beginning. Uh, and we're truly honored to hold this year's symposium in this uh, inspiring space. A little bit away from the Singh Center, which is our, our home. Uh, so this is a bit of a stretch for the engineers that live on the other side of campus. But uh, now it's my great pleasure to introduce our hosts. Uh, William Burke White, the Richard Perry Professor and Inaugural Director of Perry World House. Thanks, Russ, and congratulations to you, Zara, and the team on, on a great React conference. Uh, there's been enough wind up, and we want to get to substance, but some of you may be wondering, why are we meeting in Perry World House? That sounds like an international affairs institute. Well, it is. And maybe it's because the REACT conference uh, has such wonderful international partners from France and elsewhere in the world, but it's actually something deeper than that, which is that Perry World House is a place that is about bringing together academe and policy. And as we've done so, we have in integrated and brought the sciences deep into that process. And the REACT conference to me represents so well the two principles that stand behind that. First to me is that science needs to inform all policy decisions being made. When I worked for Secretary Clinton at the State Department, the Secretary had a science and technology policy advisor, someone who I wish we had listened to more and I wish still had a job. Um, Second, that policy needs, sorry, that the policy side of the house needs to inform the context of scientific research. And that is happening today too. There are a couple of basic principles we're committed to here at Perry World House that are represented throughout your deliberations. First is a problem orientation, that academics, scientists, or political scientists need to think about the world in light of real problems that we face. Secondly, that we need to think interdisciplinarily, bringing science and, and political science and law and sociology and every other key discipline together around these problems. Third, that we need to often and early have contact between the academic and policy worlds. Fourth, that we need to engage in translation. Sometimes we speak different languages, and when we do, whether that be the language of policy or science or French and English, we need translators. And there is so much work to be done giving us a common language. And finally, we need to think about our audiences early to figure out whom we're trying to impact and whom we're trying to inform. And as I look at the REACT agenda, I see that all five of these things are being done in today's meetings, and I am truly delighted that that is happening here at Perry World House. So I look forward to learning as the afternoon goes on, and thanks so much for being with us here at Perry World House today.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Howard Newkrug. I'm a professor of practice at the School of uh, Earth and Environmental Sciences, the School of Arts and, uh, Arts and Sciences. And uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Russ, for inviting me up to introduce my mentor, my friend, my colleague, Mark Allen Hughes. Um, and to be able to mention first that uh, we now have a water center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the water center opened up last year. We're still in our formative stages, but uh, it's very exciting to, to uh, uh, see the inroads that we've been making as we take UPenn, the U university itself, and putting it on the world map of water institutes. Uh, we are working in science, technology, and policy arenas and are seeking out partnerships across the university. Uh, we're now uh, looking to create our faculty board. So if there's faculty here who is interested in water, love to have you involved with us. Uh, Russ and his team at REACT uh, are accomplishing really great things uh, with the technology areas of the water research. So uh, I thank him for inviting me to moderate this, uh, this session of symposium. Um, the center is currently focusing on a number of different things, but uh, primarily we're looking at urban water systems. So we're taking a lot of what you see across the university and dealing with issues of aging infrastructure, racial discrimination, wealth inequities, and applying them to cities and the water and the water systems. We're also working on a watershed wide scale for drinking water source protection, advocacy, and environmental protection. And I'd welcome speaking with any of you at any time to talk further about the Water Center. Right now, I'd like to introduce Mark Allen Hughes, who is a professor of practice in school design. Uh, his current main gig is founding faculty director at the Climate Center for Energy Policy. He is also a faculty fellow at, at Penn uh, Institute for Urban Research, senior fellow for Wharton School's uh, IGEL, and distinguished scholar in residence at Penn's Fox Leadership Program. He's earned his bachelor's degree from Swarthmore and his PhD in regional science from the University of Pennsylvania. He joined the standing faculty at uh, Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School in 1986, joined the Penn faculty in 1999, I first met Mark in 2008 when Mayor Michael Nutter asked him to be his chief policy advisor and then to create the city's first office of sustainability and to establish for the first time sustainability goals for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Mark has been a friend and a colleague since then. And uh, as I grew up in the water industry, uh, working also in the city for the uh, uh, creating the office of watersheds implementing our Green Cities Clean Waters programs, and then as Philadelphia's Water Commissioner. And then in 2016, and a lot of those things I couldn't have done without you, Mark, so thank you. Uh, 2016, uh, he and his team really supported my efforts to come here to Penn and uh, work with the incredible staff at the Kleiman Center um, uh, to help develop this water center. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll hear from Mark at about 1.40. We're, uh, we're going to open it up for about 10 minutes worth of questions. Uh, but I'd like to introduce Mark. Thank you, Howard. Uh, it's very nice. Oh, exactly, exactly the way I wrote it. Um, the, uh, you know, Howard really is a legendary public figure in Philadelphia and around the world for the innovative water management policy that uh, he largely invented and you know kind of giving real uh, regulatory and policy armature to a previously fuzzy notion like green infrastructure and a real kind of hero and happy to have him now be a pen hero as well so i also want to say thanks to to russ and zara and kristen for uh, this amazing organization of this event you know we love we've ar you've already heard it once you're going to hear it again a couple of times from me you'll probably hear it uh, several more times before you leave penn's campus that we love celebrating the fact that we have 12 schools on a single compact campus as a as a geographer, I love it when provosts talk about propinquity and the advantage of spatial organization and understanding it well. But part of the value proposition for me today, and a chance to talk with all of you, is that there are people, on, colleagues on this campus, 
that I have been trying to meet for years, and I just now get to spend some time with them. Yes, I'm talking about you. The, uh, so it's fantastic to be able to have, regardless of the spatial organization, it is the human interaction and the things that it takes, leadership and other kinds of qualities, uh, it takes to, to pull that off. I, I'm no oh good. I'm not completely surrounded by uh, Bill's uh, branding anymore. I've got it in front of me. I'm happy to have it in front of me and behind me, but I see my slides are already up. The uh, Perry World House has very quickly established itself as a natural home that really takes absolutely no explanation uh, for why events are held here. Between the beauty of the space that elevates, we'll test that proposition in a few minutes, that elevates anything that happens here, um, but also the collegial, open, uh, warm, really, and I am digging that beard. You gotta keep that beard after the, uh, uh, after the classes start. Um, the, uh, the warm, really, welcome that, uh, that is always extended to colleagues. And I have not seen this or probably any other room so crowded since, actually, since I was very fortunate to attend the, uh, the opening week, actually, when it, after it moved to Broadway of Hamilton, the musical. And there's a little story there uh, that, you know, that, that, that night, as I had taken my seat and every single seat in the house was filling, there were two seats next to me that were still open. And uh, a, a, an elderly woman came in and took one of them. And as the lights were beginning to go down, I leaned over and whispered, you know, I'm so surprised that there is any seat left in this theater tonight. And she said, well, actually, unfortunately, my husband and I purchased these tickets uh, just before his death, and he's unable to attend with me this evening, and it was really very sad. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry that someone wasn't able to, to accompany you tonight. She said, well, all of the friends and family are at the funeral. <laughs> you gotta wait for it, but it always, uh, it always delivers. Now, what I want to do is try to strike in this keynote a, a, a three-note chord. I want to talk about three things. I want to lay out three claims, really, unsubstantiated by the end of these remarks, um, for your consideration. First is that while panic is ultimately a barrier to surviving any crisis, to be sure, its initial appearance is also an unobtrusive measure that the urgency of that crisis has been fully comprehended by all who need to understand it well. And I'm gonna claim that we need a little more panic before leadership can contain and channel it into the mobilization that we need to deal with some of the challenges that we face. Second, I wanna claim that research institutions like ours can only make the most important contributions that climate change in particular demands when we pay a little more conscious, atten uh, conscious attention and make necessary investments into closing the gaps in the knowledge development chain, especially the well-known gaps between basic and applied and policy and so on. We're aware of these things. We say the right things about them, but we need to close these interstitial boundaries between and among disciplines and schools and practices and so on. And the challenge of that claim is that we largely have all of the responsibility and almost all of the capacity needed to close those gaps. So it's really very much on us. And third, that if we want, there is a climate change kind of grand challenge that illustrates many of these possibilities of accelerating the transmission of ideas down or across, depending on your metaphor, a chain or network of disciplinary and other kinds of boundaries that's right here underneath our feet, all around our campus. And I wanna offer that at the very least as an illustration and potentially as an agenda. All of the data, almost all of the data that I'll be presenting uh, in this is taken from these three, these three recent, relatively recent government reports, including uh, two just this year, the special report from the IPCC on uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, which was a special report that was made at the request of parties that uh, felt that there was too much focus on the two degree goal and wanted to see what differences there were between meeting the aspirational 1.5 versus the agreed upon rock solid two. Uh, so the, these are all the sources. This uh, presentation is available, of course, for anybody who wants to kind of go further. And the bottom two are actually two, two of several very good nonprofit organizations 
that focus on visualizing some of the underlying science and data that's represented in reports like these three. Now, what's the driving process in climate change that uh, brings us here today? It is simply the Earth's energy budget. Uh, I'm not gonna, especially since I was just told that you don't, I'm not gonna follow the uh, provost lead in uh, not even making jokes, let alone trying to talk too deeply about any science in this room, as it was just explained to me that you actually don't want to scratch the surface of your coatings, and so I'm gonna stay completely uh, away from all this. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, is um, quite familiar with these processes far more than I ever will be and want to be. Uh, but that, you know, ultimately it's about the, the greenhouse gas heat trapping uh, properties of um, methane and CO2 in particular. Those are the two that are most closely associated, really fully associated with human activities as opposed to the H2O in the atmosphere and cloud cover and other things, which also, of course, has a greenhouse gas effect. Um, now, what's the defining metric of that process? It is largely, oh good, this is a little more visible to you than it is to me. This largely, this, this shows the difference, how we account for from 1870, which is the beginning of the records that are used uh, to study these atmospheric concentrations, how we account for both the sources that add concentrations of CO2 in particular in this case, uh, into the atmosphere and the sinks that remove it on the, you see coal, oil, gas, and actually a very intensive CO2 emitting process, the manufacture of, of cement, um, and then uh, processes from land use itself that actually add, serve as a source, and then the waterfall back down through the sinks, through land, into the oceans, and into the atmosphere. That has had the effect of, since 1870, raising the parts per million in the atmosphere of CO2, which is the metric that drives the conversations and much of the policy formation, from 288 to 405. That's in 2017 and 2018. The readings are more like four, just under 408. Now, what's the predicted outcome from rises in this metric? Here we've got a couple of uh, graphics from the Summary for Policymakers, which is a very handy document that is made for, uh, for people like me who are trying to influence uh, policymakers. There is far more elaborated uh, scientific analysis in all of the underlying both special reports and the AR, the assessment report number five, which is the current one, the latest 20, 2014. The next AR6 is in the midst of the very long process that, it, that the UN follows to produce these ARs. The next AR6 will be out in 2022. Uh, what these two graphs show in the, in the left panel, we have the, the representative concentration pathways that take various degrees of uh, kind of trajectories of all of the contributors to the metric of parts per million and uh, model them against different land use, fossil fuel emissions, and other kinds of changes in processes and show a variety of possible pathways for the concentrations as they will then in the lower panel eventually accumulate at different levels under different scenarios with, and here's the one that matters, I don't know if I have a, do I have a thing? Yes, I do, but is it gonna show? The, the vertical axis here is the temperature change relative to not any given annual emissions, but the accumulated total emissions of the concentrations in the atmosphere, which are predicted to have, depending on how large those concentrations are, effects on global mean temperature in the year 2000. 100 okay, at the end of this century. So those are the kinds of outcomes. Temperature change. Now, there's just one kind of quick thing. Maybe I should probably come back to this, but it's unclear that you know the underlying probability distribution of these processes is not what many people might, even policymakers, uh, might assume it is. It is not normally distributed, and this is a very much a fat tail problem, right? So that at the at the right side of that probability distribution, where you're talking about six degrees Celsius, basically a hellscape on Earth, right? Probably not even survivable by including our, many and including our species. Rather than looking like maybe, you know, under the empirical, under the empirical algorithm, right? Maybe looking like 2% likely at that tail, there's a 10% total probability of being greater than six degrees um, 
uh, increase from pre-industrial levels of uh, average temperature at 700 parts per million, um, passing 700 parts per million, which is you know, not unlikely to pass, and that's the outcome. So these fat-tailed fat things are probably misleading policymakers and decision makers in a lot of ways. Why does this outcome matter? Okay, very quickly, this is a, a graph again from one of the, from the AR5 that looks at the consequences, that gray bar across, uh, across all of the histograms are showing uh, is the current level of heating and what would happen if uh, we exceed, uh, go all the way to uh, 1.5. Five in this case. These are different kinds of concerns that range from crop yields to mortality from heat waves to the crashing end, which is unfortunately almost certain now, um, of um, at least 90% of the coral reefs in the sea and the marine habitats that uh, depend on those and the cascading, this cascading uh, possibilities for um, the biosphere as a whole. Now, Let's turn a little bit more towards into some of the solution. Now, how, how constrained at this point, how constrained rather at this point are our potential solutions, our policy solutions to dealing with this? There are many graphs on this, so I just want to show this one. What this graph shows is, and this is out of the, this is out of the uh, one and a half degree special report. So this is trying to figure out how much it would take to get by the end, to keep by the end of the century. Uh, 1.5 degrees of, of increase in global mean temperature so that you're looking at a highly constrained atmospheric concentration of CO2 and its equivalents uh, accumulating during that time. C0, this is the change in the annual emissions into the atmosphere. Almost no modeled pathway for reduction, and this is not about actual proposals about how we make these reductions. This is just graphing different curves. Almost all of the model pathways for reducing annual emissions during the course of the remainder of this century require carbon dioxide removal, require so-called negative emissions after about mid-century. We're making a huge bet on the discovery, development, and full deployment of sufficient technologies that we do not yet have at our disposal. We're making a huge bet at making all of these, uh, at meeting these targets. When the AR5 was published in 2014, there were 116 scenarios that were capable of staying under the two degree goal. And 111 of them required carbon dioxide removal. We can't avoid this problem without deploying technologies that are beyond our can at this point. Now, how much progress is the, has there been towards these goals, these temperature goals that have to do with removing, lowering the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere? Unfortunately, this curve does not look much like this one. Last year, uh, was, in 2017, was actually the first year in three that there had been an increase in uh, CO2 emissions. It was hoped that that was going to be an aberration. This year is actually the largest, is, 2018 is projected now to be the largest increase in nine years. Hmm. Now, what is going on, right? Why we've got Paris, we have technology, we have falling costs in alternatives to fossil fuel emission-based energy systems like renewables and so on. What is happening? Here's an important, and again, in the constraints of a very short talk, here's one important thing. Oh, shoot, that does not, oh yeah, can you see? Oh, you can see it, I can't see it. You can see this. You can see, we've got a, it looks like a supply and demand curve, not surprisingly. Um, so this, uh, the, the black rising curve shows the emissions path. The falling shows the fall in carbon intensity, which is CO2 per dollar of economic activity, per GDP. All right? So 
Sure, we are making huge strides globally and at the nation level about reducing the carbon intensity, finding other ways to capture, to filter, to not combust, to use solar and wind and hydro, to preserve the life of nuclear, to use the first fuel, energy efficiency, to avoid our processes, perhaps to even reduce some of our consumption patterns. We're finding tons of ways to uh, reduce the carbon intensity, and yet our emissions are going up. They're going up because of economic growth and population growth around the world. That improvement in carbon intensity has not yet been enough to swamp the counter pressures of uh, ending the energy poverty of a billion people who currently have it, right? the rising tide of economic development around the world, the ending of poverty, forget energy poverty, poverty in general around the world, and over time, these same forces are gonna to have to accommodate another one to two billion people. The challenges are huge, our progress towards them insufficient. This just breaks it down into the four largest emitters. These four emitters account for 58% of global CO2 emissions. Right? This is a very concentrated problem, and there are politics that arise from that concentration. Uh, you can see the four there on the board. China's emissions have risen remarkably. There are two things to say about that. China's fall in carbon intensity has been more impressive than our own over the same period. It's just the level of growth that's going on in the Chinese economy that is driving the growth of the emissions. And so it's, the policy problem is not, please adopt our fantastic technology that will reduce your carbon intensity. The policy challenge, at least on its face, is please uh, forego or limit the aspirations for your population, right? So it's economic growth and development in the old pattern, and it's transitioning away from it, but still emissions continue to climb. There's one other thing I want to say about it, which is annual emissions in the moment is only one of many ways that policy analysts look at allocating the responsibility for both the problem and the solution. This is a very different way than looking at just who are the top emitters right now. This is the accumulation of historical emissions. Right? And the historical emissions back from the period of 1870 to today uh, is 25% US, 22% EU, 13% China. Right? China is emitting far more right now, but only half of what the United States has ever emitted since this problem was, began being measured in 1870s. Japan, India, India only 3%. Right? So, how is that any less of an allocation of responsibility for paying, in particular, for the challenges uh, than looking at current and projected future emissions? So how are we doing next to the actual Paris Agreement, right? The 2015 agreement that is rightly, rightly celebrated as perhaps the best hope of humanity uh, to uh, stave off and manage, mitigate the challenges that have been represented very briefly here. And we've got you know, many people who in many fashions in this room have contributed to that. And one of them is, is Liz, who, you know, the, the, the kind of, the really heroic leadership that came together around the world and that where individual countries played key roles, like the United States at the time, the United States of the time, um, uh, is absolutely our best shot. How are we doing against those goals? What this graph shows is historical emissions, calculating what uh, the pledges that have been made out to 2030, the current round of uh, pledges, and the gap between what it would take, between those pledges, what the world has currently put on the line, yes, it's being ratcheted up right now, it will be every five years for as long as we're doing it, um, but the current gap between what it's now estimated to take to stave off two degree or let alone one and a half degree warming is huge, right? There is a giant emissions gap. I put it not in terms of what's going on with emissions, but the ultimate outcome, right? Because the driver of so many of the consequences and challenges that we face, that we fear, 
although I'm about to say not, we don't fear it enough. Uh, this graphic, again, by Climate Action Tracker, one of the NGOs I was pointing you to earlier, shows um, the likely outcomes from the current pledges, which far beyond two degrees. The UN just issued a report that I would you know, encourage you to, to peruse, talking about the dire differences between one and a half degrees and two degrees. Current pledges are, going to take, are likely to take us to 3.3 degrees and could easily go. That's, I, that's probably the 67% middle band that can take us up to well over four. We are not in any position to uh, accommodate those kinds of changes by the end of the century. Now, let me turn to this. Leaders, analysts, thought leaders, political leaders have been uh, evoking a metaphor recently, hello Kate, um, about uh, what we need is World War II scale mobilization in order to deal with this problem. And that is certainly consistent with all the graphs I just threw at you. That is indeed <laughs> what we require. There are many reasons, many ways of accounting for US intrans intransigence on this issue and for global uh, lack of progress on this issue. But surely one of them is US public opinion. And yes, it's true, there now appear to be finally stable majorities emerging among Americans around the reality of the problem, the human connection to the problem, and that something should be done about it. I would offer that is way less than World War II mobilization. The fact that Americans are starting to admit that there's a problem and wish somebody would make it go away is not the same thing. And so, you know, what, you know, what, the World War II metaphor, it's apt in some ways, sure, mobilization, absolutely. Existential crisis, threat, absolutely. But it's inapt in other ways. There is no single enemy. And climate change is going to require a far greater mobilization at different rates for different countries around the world in order for it to exceed. So it is the ultimate collective action problem. Climate change communication tells us we should always end, and I'm sorry, I'm not necessarily going to do this today, always end talks like this one with hope, with something for you to do so that you aren't paralyzed, right? so that uh, you don't panic, because panic is the inability for rational thought. So how's that gonna make anything better? Totally right. But people probably have the right to panic or not in the face of panic-worthy science, because how are they gonna mobilize in a sustained way without that? And that's all I'm claiming, that we need to expose people, it's our own fear of popular panic probably, <laughs> We need to expose people to the true urgency of this science in order for leaders, we need to theorize leadership. The end of every academic paper on this topic is, and we need leadership. We gotta have leadership to kind of like mobilize this. Well, that needs to be theorized a little bit, and one of the elements of that leadership is the ability to contain and channel potential panic into real action. Okay. The rest of this goes very fast. Oh, you may have noticed, in a room like this one, I probably don't even have to point it out. But uh, I think the most important element of any PowerPoint presentation is the number of slides that remain in that presentation. <laughs> Everybody always, always counts it exactly backwards. Nobody cares how many you've done. They only care about how many more you have to do. So that's what's going on in those little numbers down there. So you can see the rest of this moves a little faster. So. Now, let's talk a little bit about our own, our own organization for this problem. Right? These problems that we've all discussed, they exhibit a complexity uh, that likely inhibits discovery as well as deployment. It certainly inhibits deployment, and probably even discovery. These are the kinds of things, this is a graph from uh, chapter 17 of the National 
Climate assessment, which uh, was the one that was famously released over Thanksgiving weekend um, a couple of months ago, um, but that, again, I highly recommend it, especially this chapter, which talks about this complexity and the inability of us to conjure sufficient responses without an understanding of that complexity in all of the forms it takes across problem domains, across potentially contributing disciplines, and across fragmentation among the decision makers and implementers of these technologies. There are lots of fractures in these complex problems, and I would argue that they are far more than the poor powers of our medieval or 19th century at best departmental organizations to handle, all right? And that, there's just another one that's on, particularly actually the provost, I'm always gratified when the provost mentions something that I'm gonna mention, yeah, the nexus between energy, water, and food, for example, right? Uh, the, 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 again, another kind of problem. And frankly, I would also argue that dealing with getting ahead of some of these gaps, minding the gaps and filling them. And again, I know <laughs> we all have things we have to do, right? I am not so imprudent that I would recommend that we get rid of our imperatives. But we have to find ways to accommodate our imperatives within our disciplines and within our practices that can also accelerate the transmission and probably improve the capture of the full scope of these problems. And so we need, I would argue, new institutional platforms that will require investment that can sustain collaboration across these fractures. And it's true, we have industry partners, we have government drivers, we do not live in isolation, but we are largely, I would argue, capable of reorganizing our own institutional structure to better fit problems at this scale and threat. It's our responsibility. Nobody is gonna reorganize us and we wouldn't let anybody reorganize us anyway. But we should probably think about ways in which we can be better fitted as engineers or wannabe engineers, better fitted to the tasks at hand. I have one crazy thing. I, well, I hope only one crazy thing. I, I think twice about saying, but I'm gonna say it to this group. The, you know, in a world where, you know, panic and urgency and, you know, is, is, is maybe going to accelerate and we're trying to think about ways we could make use of that. I just have to ask the question. Uh, if we're painting ourselves into corners where we're counting on technology we have yet to invent, let alone deploy, let alone pay for, uh, what do we really think in a room like this one, right? I guess it's streaming, so it's not really a room like this one, but, but I'm going to pretend it is. In a room like this one, which do you guys, which do you all think, you know, is more likely? The invention of technology capable of saving 8,000 plutocrats with a colony on Mars, or the invention of technology capable of saving 8 billion humans with a sustainable life on Earth? Which do you really think is more likely? So, the, uh, now I'm gonna end on, you know, what is my version of the hopeful note? With a challenge beneath our feet, right? The, large, the nation's largest municipal gas utility, municipally owned gas utility is the Philadelphia Gas Works, which for 200 years has created enormous value for Philadelphia residences and industries. Right? Um, but the, the current policy mantra is electrify everything. We have been very successful at decarbonizing the electricity sector, far more successful than our ability to decarbonize anything else. The great big challenge now is transportation, and the way we're moving towards transportation is to electrify it, right? So it's about electrify everything. That is a policy goal that is workable, that is feasible, um, and that all, I think, virtually all observers uh, embrace. But it has implications for, for Philadelphia, 
And it has implications for a city where 475,000 Philadelphians, many of them impoverished, right? We have, by, we have the highest poverty rate of any of the 10 largest cities in the United States. We have 475,000 residential accounts, $25,000 commercial and industrial accounts, 6,000 miles, 6, miles of distribution pipes in that system. Uh, that is a system and a value chain that cannot possibly survive something the world urgent, urgently needs to do, which is price carbon emissions, punitively, right? That's good for the world. That is a real challenge for Philadelphia because replacing that capital stock and electrifying all of that space heating is going to be expensive and is gonna be beyond the means of many and has big capital, capital costs and stranded asset costs for the municipality. So what are the alternatives? People talk about, oh, let's dismiss the problem, let's just sell it. Oh, let's you know, kind of break it up into pieces, let's privatize it. I think there's another possibility at least, and I would love to get more of you involved in this, colleagues, uh, especially Oscar Serple, but colleagues uh, at the Kleiman Center and I have been working on this for quite some time. What if we were to leave the capital stock largely in place and simply change the gas that goes into the pipes? And what if we were to find a way of doing that that was carbon neutral? Carbon engineering, David Keith at Harvard has uh, kind of actually demonstrated an ability to remove CO2 from the atmosphere, not from the smokestack where the concentrations are nice and big and it's relatively easy to remove it, but from the atmosphere, which as we've just now covered, is only 408 parts per million. It's really hard to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. Has actually demonstrated technology with his firm, the company that um, he's, he's, he set up uh, processing now in Canada at 90 to $200 a ton of CO2 removed. Um, uh, use that CO2 with, again, another very expensive process, electrolysis. But hey, scientists, give me another way to get hydrogen, I'll take it. Take that, take that hydrogen and that CO2, use the Sabatier process, which is about as far as I can go. I'm not gonna say anything else besides the Sabatier process, uh, that 100-year-old 100 uh, 100 reaction, to synthesize methane and combust it. Now, the emissions go back in the air, but we haven't mined the ground for that methane. We've mined the atmosphere as long as the energy, which would be not insignificant, is renewable, is not carbon emitting for that process, you can leave that capital stock in place and not add net CO2 emissions into it. So like with all other interesting uh, policy questions, you know, policy, basically all the interesting policy questions are of one of two categories. One, who benefits, key bono, and two, Compared to what, which I don't know how to say in Latin, and in this, in this, pro, in this, there's, here's all the kinds of questions we're working on, actually, with some colleagues here at Penn in chemistry and, and engineering. But to fully deploy, to fully discover solutions and deploy them is going to require all kinds of disciplines and practices in order to make sense of this, right? And in the end, it's going to be very expensive. But it's only going to make sense if we understand compared to what? Compared to the cost of stranding those assets, compared to the cost of you know, being able to cook your food is a, you know, a one week problem, right? Under, when it's cold enough outside, being able to heat your home is a one day, one or two day problem. Right? There are comparing alternatives fully cost accounting all of the benefits and costs of these policy options that confront a place like Philadelphia has to be done and requires many, many, many disciplines. And those costs are all subject to discovery by scientists, engineers who can contribute to bending those cost curves down. So it is a grand challenge right beneath our feet and all around us. Mobilization, so let me just end with this. Mobilization may well require 
a little panic and the leadership to mobilize that, that panic into change. We may well need to exercise responsibilities under our control in order to make our institutions capable of making the fullest contributions and all hands on deck, and ours should probably, our hands should probably be devoted to organizing ourselves in an optimal way to make these contributions. And secondly, we have many challenges that we could work on together around this, as well as the ones we're working on separately. Nobody's asking anybody to stop those. But we have many problems that we can work on together. PGW is only an example of one. But I hope it's an example that shows that we can do much more across these disciplines than we can do, as valuable as that work is, in our own offices and labs. Thank you. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And oh, I thought it was just 10 minutes for questions. I got to. One minute for questions, nine minutes for answers. Uh, but, and I'll just leave this off. I just asked you a question about you. You mentioned leadership quite a few times here. And uh, everything you said makes a lot of sense. You've mentioned global, national, and local needs and people and, and what needs to be done. Where does this, where, where does this all happen? How do you, if we're really going to achieve this, is it a combination of all three, or are we just looking at this is the University of Pennsylvania, this is Philadelphia, uh, this is where it all has to happen. We create the model to create it out, or is it more global UN solution? I think that's a great leading question. I'm going to treat it like such, because I think, I think you and I probably agree, and I think you want me to say what I think you would say, and so I'm going to, because going to, I happen to believe it myself. The, you know, this uh, setting aside for a moment, you know, this kind of notion that we have the responsibility and discretion to change, reorganize ourselves in ways that could matter, uh, setting that aside, it's very important to know that that's not the end, right, to note, rather, that that's not the end of that, of that process. That's not going to be sufficient. It might make our answers better, but it won't make them any more used in the world. And so the, the external facing relationships happen, and, and this is certainly something, I know it happens at Perry, I know it happens at Penn IUR, I'm sure it happens with many of the things everyone in this room is involved in, and I know, it happens uh, at the Climate Center for Energy Policy, and Corey, and Bill, and Oscar, and Andy, and Jesse, and actually, there's nobody back at the center. I hope somebody's answering the phone. The, uh, we're all here. The, I, I know because I see how hard they work that uh, that's not self, this, th that step is not self-implementing, right? It's not good ideas don't sell themselves. It's that you have to make investments, and it's a two-way street you're probably going to have to spend, and this is probably true or the farther, let's call it down, this deployment chain, this innovation chain we're living and we live at the bottom of it, the, uh, you're going to probably have to be open to a concern for problems that decision makers face, most specifically, and that the world faces, most generally. Right? So being open to that is one direction of that conversation, being open to the decisions that they are facing. In the other direction, you're going to have to do more than write, right? You're probably going to have to convene, and you're probably going to have to move, and this is the most provocative thing I could probably say today, you may well be called upon to, uh, to step beyond the boundaries of what you know with scientific certainty. And, you know, for some people, that's going to be, you know, it's going to be sure. I do that all the time. But for many people, I think that's going to be scary and maybe even obscene, maybe even exactly by definition what we're designed to not do, to not step beyond what we know. And uh, I think part of the urgency of this is that we may well have to, we often do. And I always say, compared to what? Do you want people less smart than you stepping beyond the bound limits of their knowledge? Right? I don't think so. <clears throat> Mark, can I ask you a follow-on question to that? Because yes, one of the things you said was we need to expose people to the true urgency of this science. One of the risks you face in what you just said is that it contributes to the growing discrediting of the science. That is, those who don't believe in climate change continue to challenge the science itself. And if, if those who know the science step beyond bounds, does that not exacerbate this problem that we need to counter, which is that we need to 
effectively communicating to a much larger population the urgency of this challenge. So that's a that's a fantastic question, and let me let me uh, uh, revise and amend. Let me clarify my answer to Howard. So, uh, what I think is really the answer to your question is uh, that. <laughs> That the to fully convey the urgency unmitigated by a at this point almost formulaic hopeful addendum right at the end of the message uh, does not have to step beyond the science. I would argue that there's so much headroom uh, between the messaging. I mean, right now there are individual scientists who pose a counterexample to this, but in general terms, I would say. There's so much headroom in the messaging that's going out around the science between what we really can speak with with full scientific confidence um, and in conveying the urgency, we got room for that. The Howard, uh, in answer to Howard's question, I intended only to convey what it might be like when after the writing, after the convening, when you're in the room with decision makers and you're called upon to help advise, potentially, on judgment calls, the reaction to that. And that's when I think sometimes you can step, you'll, you'll be called, you know, you may be called upon to step beyond the boundaries of your scientific certainty. And that's when, again, I think the compared to what question is, do you want somebody who's not as smart as you doing it, on, av on average as smart as all of you in this room, um, or not? And that's, but that's a trade-off. That itself is an, an obvious judgment call about advice. Speaking of judgment calls in, in particular, um, in a scary talk, uh, to me the most scariest thing was the fat tails in the fat tail in the global warming temperatures they showed us. Um, and, and these tails usually arise from you know highly correlated auto you know, improbable but highly correlated autocatalytic kind of processes. And so I was wondering if you could elab elaborate a little bit more on what some of those might be. Well, I, actually, I, let, me, let me step back, because that is going to get into some of the scientific processes that, you know, I'm, I'm right at the, I'm towing the line on my, on my uh, ability to contribute to that conversation. But let me, let me do, answer a different aspect of, of, of the question. Um, there's, a, there's a recently retired, newly emeritus, uh, very eminent economist at, um, at, who was at Harvard named Marty Weitzman, who uh, wrote a book called Climate Shock. Does anybody, does anybody know this book? It's really, it's written for, you know, it's written for an audience like this one. Uh, it's, it's very compelling. But one of the things that he does in that book, and he's, he's really the person who had the standing uh, to kind of ch actually, what he does is, who's heard of the Stern Report by by Lord Stern, Nicholas Stern at LSE, that came out in, in 2007 and was the for many years the defining call, uh, evidence based call to uh, to do something about this about this important challenge, and and Weizmann kind of stood up and, and challenged some of the things that Lord Stern had done. And, and one of them was about the underlying probability distribution that was being used in what was even then considered a very dire Stern report. And Weizmann made this case about, about the fat-tailed nature of these things. And one of the things that he did, and, and, and this is really, this is a, a, a response to your question that says, you know, what can someone who's trained like me try to, try to kind of uh, um, change about the current conversation? He used a set of expert interviews, an expert panel, to, uh, to kind of uh, go deeper on some of the tipping points and other kinds of things that, that may be lying underneath these fat tails, and, and then used econometrics to kind of make some estimates. And he estimates, and again, this is so beyond, so outside the conversation right now, and Liz is right, Sometimes it's out, some, it's some, some, some of it's outside the conversation because it seems so extreme. And it does risk, it can't be true, right? But Weizmann has estimated that you have to greatly increase the slope of the damage function 
for some of these outcomes, and that when you go into, when you ask experts around the tipping points and then aggregate them in the appropriate way and then compare them to um, some of these outcomes, he estimates that there will be a loss of, uh, at a six degrees Celsius increase at the end of the century, would result in a 50% decline in global GNP, which is basically catastrophe. Right? It's basically the end of, in any, re if that percentage is right, any actual outcome where such a thing would unfold would be so catastrophically disorganizing and everything else that it would be the end of civilization as we know it, right? So. Uh, you talked about, uh, you know, the need for a World War II kind of mobilization to deal with the problem. And, you know, before World War II or before the United States got into World War II, there was Pearl Harbor. So that probably what kind of induced that panic and that mobilization of the public. Right. And so what do you think would induce that kind of panic? Because you've, we've seen, you know, fires, we've seen hurricanes with such intensity you know, unprecedented in intensity, but still like people don't, it's still kind of a local effect of that panic and the larger public does not see it. So what would induce that kind of large scale, big panic to make sure that the, you know, the problem is dealt with? That's right, That's a, that, that is a great question. Uh, no one responds, at least yet, and I can't imagine them being much worse. I mean, the damages could be worse, but the photographs couldn't be much worse. No one has yet responded to a photograph of Maria or any one of the other natural climate-related disasters that have occurred. Nobody responds to that photograph the way they respond to the Pearl Harbor photograph, right? We could theorize a little bit about the differences and try to maybe parse some kind of instruction from those differences about how to, to use similar kinds of messages, perhaps. But I'm going to give you a very short answer, <laughs> uh, just because I don't have a better one. Um, I think the best tool that we have to m create urgency toward mobilization is the science. I really do. And I think the, sure, we can lay our stories into that science, but I think the stories we got, there is coverage about fires in California. There is coverage about Syria being a, a war whose drought was probably precipita uh, magnified, if not precipitated, by water shortages that have to do with some of the science that we've been talking about. We have stories. I feel like we need to not even develop. We need to promote more of the underlying science. That's just my, that would be my contribution to a, a conversation around, around these things. Do I have to get off? Yes. Okay, good. I'm sure they're very glad about that. So after that stirring discussion, I have the pleasure of having three wonderful speakers limited to speak in a total of 15 minutes each. So we're going to keep it about 12 minutes. So we have three minutes for questions. And I found the best method for that is for me to stand up and appear peripherally. Okay? But if it doesn't work, then I'll work my way ever closer to the podium. <laughs> so in fact, I'm really excited to have this chance to introduce our speakers. It's a beautiful collaboration that's been going on between uh, Giant and Ken. And uh, I'm going to get to start by introducing David Riasito. And he's an Associate Professor of Material Science at uh, the Global Institute of Technology. He has a Master's from University Joseph Kuhn, yeah. and then PhD at the Global Institute of Technology, John. And he's, uh, his interests are thin films, and materials, and nanostructures. And his discussion today is going to focus on surfaces with wettability contrasts. So David, welcome. Thank you. There is nothing. Um, OK, so today I'm going to uh, talk about why and how we can 
change every kind of surface in a surface where we can control the wettability and change the wettability in the different areas of a surface. So you know that, unfortunately, the natural disaster like hurricanes, tsunamis, and earthquakes are killing many people everywhere, every year, sorry, around the world. But maybe something that is worse is that survivors are not really safe after such kind of natural disaster because they will uh, encounter like many uh, huge risk factors and the main ones are listed here. So I would like to focus on two of them. So the first one is the lack of potable water and the second one is the high exposure to bacteria. So I think that as a material scientist, I have to do my best to uh, fix such kind of problem. And this is why my group is involved with our US colleagues in the REACT program. So in the frame of the Act 1, we are trying to uh, make something that is transportable and that can supply water everywhere and without energy. Okay. So how we can do something like that? I guess that the best idea is to try to copy that the company that already did it. And this company is our Mother Nature. So on this picture, you can see a beetle living in the Nabib desert. And even in the desert, this beetle is able to collect water from uh, the dew in the desert. So the water is collected on the beetle back and drive down to its mouth and the beetle can drink it. Okay, how oh, it works. So it's based on the wettability of the back. So what is the wettability? So wettability is the uh, ability of a couple of liquid and surface to like each other. Or in other words, it's the ability for a liquid to wet a given surface. So a way to quantify that is by measuring theta. Okay, sorry. So theta is the angle in between the liquid surface and the solid surface. In the case of water, theta is called the water contact angle. And there is two main cases. So the first one is a surface like the water, and in this case, the surface is called hydrophilic. It's a case when theta is lower than 90 degrees, and in this case, the dual plate shape is almost half ellipsoidal. If the surface don't like water, the dual plate shape is more spherical, and the contact angle is greater than 90 degrees. And in this case, the surface is called hydrophobic, not like water. Okay? What is the link with the beetle? If we look to the back of the beetle, there is different parts. There is some bump that are hydrophilic, they will attract the water. And some valleys that are hydrophobic, they will repel the water, so drive it down to the mouth. So this is one idea, and now we have better objective on how we can reach our goal. So the first one is we have to make a patchy surface with hydrophilic and hydrophobic areas. As our goal is to use such kind of surface after a natural disaster, for example, we have to be able to make such kind of surface with a low-cost process, and we are, want to do uh, it in large-scale area. Then we don't want to use perfluo compound because they are suspected to be endocrine um, disruptors. And we want to save people, but we want to keep them <laughs> in a good health, okay? And as we want to keep them as best as possible, we want to prevent the bacteria proliferation in our water. So for the synthesis approaches, we decided to use the soil gel chemistry. So please stay here. It's, I guess, the only slide about chemistry. Why we have chosen this one is because it's really simple, as simple as, as even me, I can understand it. So it's based on two main reactions. So first we made a solution, okay, so we mix compound, 
And one of the compound is the precursor. The precursor is like the one on the top with a metal atom surrounded by different number of alkoxide group. And one of the alkoxide group will react with um, uh, water, and this is the hydrolysis step, okay, with an hydroxyl group. And when two groups like that interact together, they start to condense, and they will make a metal oxide metal chain, okay? So this is the first step of the reaction, the solution to salt reaction. And if this reaction goes to completion, we made a gel, which is a continuous phase okay, of the metal oxide uh, clusters. So it's why this chemistry calls the salt gel chemistry. So in our case, we will use it in order to make thin film. So we just have to take sol some, the salt, coat it on the substrate, and we will make a new kind of surface. And to do such kind of coating, we can use spin coating, spray coating, and whatever we want, okay? And due to this simple process, we can make a square meter of different coating with less than 50 cents, okay? So it's really cheap. And this is why we have chosen this chemistry. Now about the weightability. With such kind of matter of uh, chemistry, we mainly made uh, oxide. So if you look to a freshly made oxide, usually it's hydrophilic. So it means that the contact angle in between the oxide and water is quite low. In the case of titania, freshly made titania is low as 10 degrees. And the main question is, can we transform this into something more hydrophobic or less hydrophilic? So we try, we coat our surface with something called hexagonal trimethoxysilane. Sorry for the name. Now we will use C16 because there is 16 carbon atom, okay? So thanks to the trimethoxy group, we can enter the C16 on the surface of titania, okay? Then we dry it and we remove the excess with ethanol. And after this kind of coating, the contact angle is increased up to 100, 110 degrees. Okay, so it's effective if we want to transform an hydrophilic surface to an hydrophobic one. And there is no fluor in the C16, so it's not a perfluor compound. Great. What if we do the same with another oxide, like silica? We did it, and there is no change in the contact angle. So now it means that we can start with two different materials, coat them with C16, and one will be hydrophilic, the other one will be hydrophobic. So the question is how we can control where there is silica and where there is just titania on the same surface. So thanks to the versatility of the salt gel reaction, we can combine our titania precursor with different molecules. And one of these one is called benzoyl acetone, BZAC. And after this combination, we will make a complex. And this complex, after coating, is soluble in alcohol. So it means that after coating, if I put some ethanol on the surface, I will remove everything. But after uh, UV light exposure, the gel is no longer uh, soluble in ethanol, so it's stable. So what I can do is that we can take a substrate, whatever surface you, you want, coat it with the silica, then coat it with titania, expose the area we want with UV light, and after just by washing it with a mixture of ethanol and water, we are supposed to have such kind of structure. So we did it and it works. So the purple stripes are titania, when the other one are silica, and you can see the the height of the material is only 200 nanometers. So we did it, and you can see in between it's perfectly flat, so it seems we remove all the titania in between the stripes. So the next step is we just have to coat it with C16, and we are supposed to have part with hydrophilic areas and part with hydrophobic area. So we did it, and it failed. So usually it's like that in material science. It works on the PowerPoint, but not in the real life. So why it failed? It's because there is a very, very thin layer of titania in between the 
large one, so uh, one with a large eight. And due to that, the contact angle is high everywhere. So just to keep you in mind, we wash it with a mixture of ethanol and water. And with that, the contact angle is around 100 everywhere. So what I said is to my students is, please try with something else, like something that you cannot drink, like uh, methanol or butanol, and it's the same, unfortunately. So we say, okay, we will try it with something maybe stronger, like chloridic acid, and now the contact angle fail. So it works. Thanks to that, we can have a surface, a given surface, coated with our material, and one part is hydrophilic, the other part is hydrophobic. So again, the purple part is titania, so the contact angle is 110, and the other part is silica, and the contact angle is low as 10 degrees. Okay, so now we can do surface with wettability different in different areas. Okay, great. What about the bacteria and things like that? So based on this paper made by um, um, a group in New York, we can see the green spots are E. coli bacteria, okay? And the value in parentheses is the contact angle of the surface. So you can see there is a, an increase of the contact angle from the left side to the right side. In the middle part, there is some green spots. So it means that for a value in between 20 to 150 for the contact angle, the water contact angle, there are many E. coli on the surface. But for something super hydrophilic and for something super hydrophobic, it means that there is almost no E. coli graft on the surface. Already? <laughs> okay. So it means that if we can do a super hydrophilic surface and super hydrophobic surface, first, maybe it will be better for collecting water and it may uh, prevent um, bacterial colonization. So how we can do such kind of surface? So first is, again, about titania and silica at the beginning. So this is the contact angle over time. So at the beginning, it's very low. And it's, there is a, a fast increase of the contact angle due to, um, to the adsorption of pollutant. Okay, but this is not super hydrophilic. So the idea is, what if we mix them? And usually, uh, not usually, so sometimes when you add two things, one plus one is more than two. And in this case, it was true. If we mix silica and titania, we have something super, super hydrophilic, and it stays super hydrophilic for more than 50 days. Okay, great. Now we know how to do super hydrophilic coating. And about the super hydrophobic coating. So there is models called Wenzel and Cassie Baxter models that say that if you increase the roughness of the surface, you can increase um, is hydrophobic um, feature from hydrophobic to hydro, super hydrophobic one. Okay, or we can increase the roughness of our titania. So one idea is by using other coatings. So first we coat the substrate with polystyrene spheres with different sizes. And then we coat it with titania and we just have to burn the polystyrene and coat with C16 and we will make a rose titania surface. It will look like that, okay? So it's a very spongious surface. And due to that, the contact angle shift from 110 to 160. I guess you can see the droplets that are already spherical. Okay, so we can do super hydrophobic coating thanks to our method. But what about the dynamical point of view? Because we want to drive the droplet down to some, somewhere like the beetle. So in the dynamical point of view, here the surface is uh, tilted by less than one degree. And when the droplet touches the surface, it will move. You will see. Okay. So it seems that we can do a super hydrophobic surface that can drive 
water where we want. So to sum up, we can, <laughs> so thanks to the C16, we can functionalize the surface and uh, transform it from hydrophilic to hydrophobic one, okay? So without fuel compound. So we can control where is um, hydrophilic part and where is hydrophobic part. We know how to do super hydrophobic coating and we know how to do super hydrophilic coatings. Great. So what next is we have to set a new device in order to uh, do some water collection experiment. We have to uh, work on the patchy surface with super hydrophobic and super hydrophilic coatings and we are working on the bacterial addition and colonization on our surfaces. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh -huh. It's due to the surface um, activity. So they, they don't, um, one is more uh, reactive than the other one. Okay, so it's why there is a difference. So back to the, this slide. So the metoxy group cannot easily uh, ensure to the silica. Okay, so if you want to ensure the, the metoxy group on the silica, you have to eat the surface. Thank you. Welcome. So, Sabine is at the Complex Assemblies of Salt Matter Lab in Bristol. She is interested in living organisms and their interactions with surfaces, disinfecting them, and early detection of bacteria to the PhD in material science. And she's going to be discussing with us bacteria detection with plasmonic microcapsules. Yeah. <laughs> The provost made fun of me, so now I feel bad. Okay. So hi, everybody. So I'm, I'm Celine, and today I will um, talk about the detection of the bacteria with a uh, new uh, nanosensor, which are a plasmonic uh, microcapsule. So this work has been uh, carried out at uh, COMPASS. COMPASS is a joint unit between uh, Solvay, CNRS, and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so I want to comment briefly on the, about, talk about my supervisor, Remy Dreyfus, who uh, was supervising me the, during uh, three years, um, and who's working on the uh, sensors. Okay. So bacteria can be found everywhere. Uh, they're on your toilet seat, but not only. They're on your purses, wallet, in water, on your skins. Um, and uh, bacteria uh, can, are the main um, causes of uh, infectious diseases. And infectious diseases uh, caused by bacteria are among the 10 uh, causes of death and uh, di disability worldwide. Uh, bacteria are a high concern, especially in uh, food processing and uh, in the healthcare sectors. And the natural disasters uh, are a direct cause of uh, large spreading of uh, bacteria and, uh, and therefore of infectious diseases uh, due to uh, poor sanitation and also uh, contaminated water. So there is a global need to prevent uh, microbial contamination. Okay. Um, so bacteria can be found as uh, like uh, unique entities uh, in, uh, in water, but all, when they enter in contact with surfaces, uh, they can uh, anchor, attach on the surfaces, and then they can grow. So on this slide, I show a simple experiment. So this is a, yeah, you'll really see it, a myelophilic uh, channel in which we have uh, put uh, bacteria with some nutrients, some food, and then we've let that grow for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, you see some uh, some uh, white-ish layer on the surface of this channel. And we, when we zoom on the, this surface, you see uh, a lot of bacteria have contaminated the whole surface. So this uh, specific uh, layer is called a biofilm. So it's made of bacteria and the stuff that they make uh, when they grow. So when bacteria are in uh, a biofilm, they can survive for a very long period of time. It's very hard, hard to kill them. And also, uh, this biofilm, they act as a reservoir of pathogen because bacteria can be released from this biofilm and then uh, contaminate other clean areas. Therefore, this is why we need uh, 
new detection method uh, to be able to uh, localize when bacteria attach and start growing on those surfaces so that we can fight the development of the biofilm. Okay, so there are different methods to do that. Um, so one thing that we know from the literature is that uh, when uh, bacteria uh, are present uh, with, with food, so with carbohydrate, for instance, they can ferment. And during the fermentation process, they create uh, organic acid. And due to the presence of this organic acid, uh, the pH can locally decrease. So by um, checking what's the pH uh, on the surfaces, we can therefore know if you have presence of bacteria and if they are growing on surface. So this, on this picture, uh, you, you'll see uh, that uh, you have a bacteria and the pH on the surfaces can drop from 8 to 4.5 units. Okay. So there are different methods uh, to uh, detect uh, the presence of uh, bacteria or biofilm uh, using uh, pH sensors. So one of them, uh, which is the mainly used one, uh, is uh, uh, involve the use of uh, molecule dyes. So those uh, dyes are molecules that are, have, are pH sensitive. Um, however, uh, these dyes, they, can, uh, they have drawbacks, and one of them is that uh, they can interact, they can be degraded by light. And also, uh, sometimes that they have a hard time diffusing uh, through the, the different layer of the biofilm. Another method is the use of uh, microelectrode. But the microelectrode, so it's easy to use, but uh, when uh, we incorporate them uh, within the biofilm, uh, it can uh, perturb the local surrounding of the, of the bacteria and the biofilm. So it's a little bit hard uh, to make this work. Um, so our idea was to make a new type of sensor, so it would be a tiny, tiny micron-sized sensor that we could deposit on surfaces. And those sensors would, uh, by a change of color, indicate uh, if the pH on surfaces uh, varies. So by that way, you could, uh, we could know if we have bacteria attaching and growing on the surfaces. So this uh, cartoon shows uh, one side of the surface which, which has a high pH, with a sensor that would be red, for instance. And on the other side, you have bacteria in, in the, uh, purple here, who have grown on the surface. They have lowered the pH uh, of that surface. And uh, this has uh, induced a change of color of the sensor, the sensor turned blue. So this is the idea. So how can we make those type of sensor? Well, we use gold nanoparticles. So we'll explain briefly the ID. So gold nanoparticles, they have very interesting optical properties. And one of them is that when you take uh, many gold nanoparticles, and when they're very far apart, they absorb light in the blue part of the spectrum, and you will see them red. But when you bring them close to each other, then the nanoparticle will absorb light in the red part of the spectra, and then you'll see them blue. So what we want to do is make a uh, so micron uh, size sphere, and pack on top of those sphere gold nanoparticles. So when you have them close pack, you'll see the micro sensor blue uh, due to the tiny distance between the gold nanoparticles. And then using a pH sensitive uh, polymer that would uh, be inside those sphere, um, when you uh, change the pH, you can have those spheres swell. And then by swelling, so you increase the size of the sensor, and you also increase the distance between the nanoparticles present on this sensor, and therefore you induce a change of color. And in that case, uh, when the nanoparticles are far enough from each other, you will see the sensor look red. So this is the cartoon here. Okay. So how can we make such a sensor? Uh, we use an emulsion uh, template process. So we disperse an oil phase in water, in, uh, containing a monomer in water containing a gold nanoparticle. We obtain an emulsion, uh, which is a pink red, uh, due to the fact that the gold nanoparticles stabilize the, uh, the emulsion, and you have a few of them on the emulsion in initially, they're far from each other, therefore the emulsion is red. Then we polymerize, we form a thin shell of an elastic shell uh, of uh, so polymer, uh, and uh, also, during, uh, this takes uh, some time, and during that time, uh, more nanoparticles can absorb at the interface, at the all water interface, and you have, in that case, many, many nanoparticles, but the surface area didn't change, so the nanoparticles are very, very close to each other. And this is why uh, we uh, have, at the end, a microsensor, it's actually a microcapsule, which contains oil inside, water outside, an elastic shell made of uh, polymer which is pH sensitive and embedded in that polymer, you have uh, gold nanoparticles that are highly, highly packed 
And this is why the sensor is blue. OK. So now, to test that uh, our micron size sensor is indeed pH sensitive, uh, we perform a simple experiment. We put it in a, in a small capillary, a small tube. So at low pH, pH 1, uh, those micron size sensors are blue. And uh, then we uh, inject, uh, we diffuse some uh, solution of NOH at a very high pH uh, from the left to the right. You see it on the movie. Um, and when this solution uh, diffuses inside the capillary, so the pH changes, it increases, and you already see what's going on. So the, the micro sensor, the micro capsule, changes from blue to red, and you can follow so the, the change, the local change of the pH, uh, by using those type of sensor. Okay. So next, what we did was try to understand a little bit more, characterize what's going on. So one of the experiments we did was uh, try to know uh, how much uh, this uh, micron size sensor uh, swell, um, since the swelling induced the increase of the distance of the, between the nanoparticle and therefore the change of color. So it takes only 10% of swelling to see a change of color uh, from blue to red. Then we wanted to know at which pH uh, this change of color happens. So we perform another simple experiment. We uh, prepare different solution, uh, buffer solution at different pHs. And then we placed uh, our uh, micron uh, size capsule in each of these solution. And then we measure the, the color of those, uh, of those micro capsule. Uh, so we see that there is a sharp jump at around pH 8. So be, be uh, low pH 8, uh, these micron size sensors are more bluish. Uh, and then when you pass the jump and you go above pH 8, then the micro sensors are very uh, much red. Okay. So to see, uh, to prove that, if, um, that the, this sensor could be used for bacteria detection, we selected uh, one uh, bacteria, a model bacteria, which is here uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, so uh, we selected this, uh, this bacteria because it's a bacteria that can be uh, highly resistant to uh, antibiotic. Uh, it can survive in a very uh, harsh condition. Uh, and it's a frequent cause of uh, hospital uh, um, acquire infection and also a foodborne uh, illnesses. So when uh, this bacteria grow in presence of uh, nutrient uh, trigger, for instance, uh, they can... Uh, 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 ferment and then uh, so they create uh, acid like I explained in the introduction and uh, with this type of bacteria so we obtain a pH drop from 8 to 4.5. So we use uh, those bacteria, we let them grow and then we mix uh, different uh, solutions with bacteria at different concentrations with our micron size sensor and we measure the color of our sensor and what we uh, observe is that uh, indeed that uh, so 10 to the power 3 uh, CFU per mil, so it's a certain number of bacteria, a uh, lower number, uh, the micron size sensor uh, are red and uh, as the population of bacteria increases, uh, then the, the micron size sensor change color and uh, from 10 to the power 6, especially to 10 to the power 8, uh, the micron size sensor really, really change color uh, from red to uh, purple. So this uh, sensor can be used for the detection of bacteria. Uh, so we call it in planktonic state. This is in solution. So to conclude, so we've uh, made a pH plasmonic micro sensor. We've, uh, we can use them for bacteria detection uh, in solution. Uh, we are still working to make it work on the surfaces. We have now a, a new PhD student that will be supervised by Remy as well, uh, who will have uh, the chance uh, to make this technology work uh, on surfaces. So we have to make uh, the sensor more stable so that uh, we can then, uh, then see the change of color when bacteria develop uh, on surfaces. So to finish, I want to thank a couple of people and also the funding agencies. Everybody in REAC will allow me to do this science. You know, I had access to the best professor, best advisor, and of course the facilities here. The science center is is really was gold for me. It was really it was really nice. So my advisor, he's in the room somewhere. I don't know where. Maybe he left. Not interested. I think he's here. And uh, one of my interns, Alexandre, who did the work on the bacteria. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll take it. We have time for questions. Very interesting idea of you use plasmodics to test out bacteria. What would be the advantage of using capsules instead of something like microgels? 
you can encapsulate, and you can do it with microgel as well, but uh, in this, uh, you can, for instance, uh, think of a technology where you can detect in, uh, by encapsulating antimicrobial, then you can also kill, so detection, kill, detection, killing, and it's uh, one big advantage. Thank you. I was just wondering if you've done any testing on uh, cycling stability or if the vision for this project was a one time coding. Okay, great, thank you. So, our next speaker is Dr. KG Yu. He uh, works um, at the, the Professor of Chemical Engineering at STU. All of his degrees are from some national degrees. His postdoc is from MIT. He joined the faculty in 2007 and has a leading role at RISE. And his interests are in interfacial manipulation of functionalized chromosomes. Today he's going to discuss hierarchical nanostructured membranes for clean and safe water. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Pil Jin Yu, coming from Sangyung Gwan University, South Korea. Uh, the first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to here, and also I'm very happy to join the, this REACT program. And as far as I know, the REACT program, the main agenda is with water and energy. And so I'd like to talk about the, one of the water issues for the water treatment. So my topic today is the hierarchically nanostructured membrane for clean and safe water, uh, which is about a intriguing some designing ideas for making high-performance membrane uh, while utilizing the uh, hierarchical or the multi-scale engineering concept. So uh, as we recognize well, that we are facing a very serious problems of the water depletion, the mainly due to the very rapid the urbanizations and industrialization. So this is the reason why uh, there is a very huge growing need for uh, developing a more efficient and robust and new technologies for the water treatment. And the first issue, why we need to develop a the new uh, the water treatment technology that can be found from a the microbial contamination issues of the water. And as shown here, the more than uh, 700, uh, 700 millions of people are uh, experiencing the water shortage pro uh, the, the problem. And at the same time, uh, the, therefore, the week, if we can the relevantly the relieve the, uh, these kinds of the issues, uh, substantially improve the uh, water sanita sanitation technologies all over the world, probably more than 10% of the uh, global disease burdens can be relieved, which is more about related with the uh, water, water bound disease here. So the water from digest, which is the caused by consumptions of the contaminated water, which is containing a the pathogenic microorganism. And when these kinds of the microorganisms contains inside the water, and if the people is drinking such a contaminated water, there is a possibility of getting this kind of huge amount of the various kinds of the, uh, uh, the water from digest. And basically, uh, the, the problem is that, the problem is that, uh, for example, for these kinds of the microorganisms such as a viruses or the bacteria particle of which size is quite small. Therefore, even the presence of the viruses or bacteria, even in very uh, apparently, the transparent looking water, actually there's no way to identify the presence of the uh, uh, viruses or the bacteria with our bare eye. So, and I think another issue is why we need to develop a, the new technologies for the water development. It can be found from recently arises issues on the nano and the microplastic. And as shown in this infographic, as you can see here, the plastic bottle. And more than 93% of the plastic bottle is containing a huge amount of the microparticles of the plastic. And as a result, and per one liter of the drinking water, that there is a possibility of containing more than 10,000 of the nano and microplastic particles. So this is really, really big concerns for the next generation, uh, the people. So the main issues is that, and actually there is no direct the correlations between the uh, consumptions of the microparticle and its harmfulness to the human health it has not been investigated fully, but 
WHO is seriously gives a alarming that there should be some potential toxicity of these microplastics to human health. The main problem is that when these microparticles or nanoplastics are consumed by the sea creatures, the amount and the concentration gradually increases with ascending the orders of the uh, uh, the, the food chain, so which will eventually exceed the, some safe limit to the human health. So this is the reason why we need to effectively remove and reduce the amount of the uh, diffused amount of the plastic particle at the main site of the drainages. And when it comes to the, the uh, I think that the best technologies for figuring out these kinds of the issues will be the membrane technology. And, and, and basically, the membrane can be classified according to the pore sizes inside. And for example, if we are interested in the, uh, some kinds of the virus particles of the nanoplastic, of which sizes are generally ranged in between 5 nanometers to the 100 nanometer, which can be mostly covered by the nanofiltrations or the ultrafiltration technology. And when it comes to the membrane, I think the performances of the membrane can be simply identified uh, by two factors. The first one is the permeability, and the second one is the selectivity. Permeability means that how large amount of the volumetric capacities can be treated uh, per a unit area of the membrane, per a unit time of scale, and the uh, selectivity issue is about how effectively removing out yeah, the particle of the interest. And, but interesting thing is that uh, for a conventional the dense membrane system, if we use this the very thin membrane, because the resistivity inside the membrane is quite low, therefore, uh, the, we can expect a very high flux, but it, accordingly, we can lose this sort of selectivity. Lots and lots of target particles are simultaneously penetrating throughout the uh, membrane. And on the other hand, if we use this thick membrane, in these cases, accordingly, we can expect a, the, we can expect very good selectivity issue, selectivity performances, but there should be a significant reductions in the permeability. Therefore, attaining both high selectivity and permeability, this is really, really challenging issues. So, these kinds of the contradictory issues, uh, this contradictory issue is perfectly plotted, inverse proportionality, which is well known as a dilemma for the membrane engineer. To figure out these kinds of the issues, one possible way is to use the, uh, the porous membrane. The here, the surfaces of the membrane, it contains a uniform pore. All the pore size is perfectly uniform, which can provide the perfect selectivity and the rejection efficiencies to target molecule. But the issue is that when the surface structure is broken and if there is some kind of mechanical collapse, this is total failure, total failure. So this is the big issue. So we need to develop how we can obtain the both high selectivity and permeability. And we try to learn these kinds of the membrane system from the nature. If you're looking at our renal ultrafiltration systems in kidney, actually this is a very, very smart membrane system. As you can see here, the basic structures of the uh, uh, renal ultrafiltration, it contains a Bowman's capsule, and inside there are the three dimensionally architecture, the blood capillaries, which has a very highly entangled structure which is the covered by uh, the podocyte membrane cell. And they're basically due to the extremely the enlarged surface area of the podocyte cell, our kidney system is providing an outstanding filtration efficiency. It shows that eight liters per square meter per hour only with pressurizing, only with 0.02 bar pressurized condition. This is a natural capillary that is generated inside our body. So if we try to mimic these kinds of the natural membrane system, probably one can propose these kinds of the very complicating structure. As you can see here, the feed streams are three-dimensionally distributed all of this the individual unit, the membrane unit, and in, 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 in independent, the, uh, the individual, the membrane unit has a perfectly isopore structure. If we can make these kinds of the membrane structure, it works nicely. It, it looks like a very fascinating. The problem is that realizing this structure is technically and technologically and economically not feasible. And, and because a complexity of the structure is really, really high. So we need to figure it out how we can make these kinds of the noble structure uh, with uh, some economic viability and technological uh, feasibility. 
So here we propose a new design for the hierarchical designing for the membrane. Here, this is it comprises simple two steps. The first step is to preparing the large scale macroporous template. Actually, these kinds of macroporous templates are still, it has very still large form, which is not enough for separating very fine sized particles, but it can provide a lots of advantages. Large scale processability, mechanical durability, and high permeability. And after the completions of this macroporous template, then we can incorporate the secondary engineering to control the pore sizes and surface functionality. And for a, as for a, the first a representative template uh, with a, some uh, the macropores template characteristic, we have chosen the inverse OPA. Actually, I think a, uh, some of you know the, what is the inverse OPA, but inverse OPA means that in order to understand in, inverse OPA, we need to first understand what is the OPEL. Opaline structure, and actually, if you, if you are working with a some of the crater particle of which sizes are perfectly uniform, if these kinds of the crater particles are self-assembled to a crystallized structure, it forms a face centered cubic structure, apsis crystal structure. And these kinds of apsis crystal structure, the crater ball is exhibiting an opaline like a property, which shows a very exquisitely beautiful reflective color. And this is the reason why the opaline is called as a germstone. And here we use this apsis C crystalline uh, opaline structure, but instead of utilizing the opaline structure, we try to make as an inverse of structure. The main reason is that opaline structure has a very high volumetric occupancy, which means that this is not porous structure. Therefore, instead of using the intact structures of the opal, we try to use this the inversely replicated structure. So here, we incorporate, we infiltrate a, some of the, the frame material, and this frame material is solidified, and then intrinsic crater particles are etched away, and which leaves these kinds of inverse superstructure. And the benefit of this inverse superstructure is that it has a very high volumetric porosity and also all of the structures are interconnected. So this is a really, really nice good material as a template for a membrane. So this is the examples for the, uh, our made inverse superstructure. It can be large scale, the large size scale though. And actually, if you're looking at this uh, the photo, it entire width is just a 30 micrometer, which is still thinner than the size of the human hair. But so some of you, you will think that, okay, the pores are really, really small. But basically, the pore size is a 150 to 300 nanometer. This is the still very, very large as compared to our targeting virus particle. So that means that this is good. This is good as for a macro pores primary template, but we need a secondary engineering to reduce down the pore. So, and for a, as for the, the, uh, the secondary nanostructure, we can employ various kinds of the uh, uh, engineering approaches. For example, we can do a internal surface coating to reduce its pore sizes, or we can tune the surface, inner surface functionality. And at the same time, we can incorporate the secondary nanostructure to control the other pore size as well. Eventually, we can expect a, some completion and constructions of the uh, highly performing the membrane, next generation membrane material. So uh, I'm going to give you some of the uh, some short uh, some some example how, how, what kinds of the other approaches we have tried before. So the first example is about the black polymer based nano like membrane. And as shown here, we got a motivated by this kinds of the manhole cover, and we got ideas that using this primary pores of the inverse of structure, we tried to inc. Okay, three minutes. I'm going to rush to the final slide. So we we try to incorporate the black polymer based nano which is making something like a nano clander like structure. So this is the result. We have made the inverse of structure incorporated with this the black hole polymer nano -sip. The Here, the pore sizes can be controlled in between 30, micrometer, 30 nanometers to 30, uh, 10 to 30 nanometer according to the molecular weight of the black hole polymer. And we have tested the performances. And it shows that as compared to the conventional black hole polymer membrane, we could observe the very high permeability and at the same time, because it has a perfectly isoport characteristic, therefore it shows a perfect rejection to the target, uh, target particle. 
And our second example is that instead of using single colloidal particle, what would happen if we use this the Cauchy structured colloidal particle? An interesting point is that after we making these kinds of inverse of structure, we selectively remove out the outer shell part, which is making these kinds of the yeah, some single colloidal particle nested inverse of structure. And these are the actual images. And as you can see here, because there is some size differences between the colloidal particle and outer cages of the inverse of so there is a very, very narrow gap, narrow channel is made in between this nested colloidal particle and outer frame. And we try to use these kinds of narrow nano channels for filtrating a target particle. And it shows that by virtue of the three-dimensional interconnected structure and also very good ice porous characteristic, we could observe very high permeability and selectivity performances. And our very last examples will be, this is a little bit different from the previous introduced example. And here we have used this. We try to make some catalytic reactive membrane for removing out, a spontaneous removing out the organic species. So here, in order to provide the surface reactivity, catalytic reactivity, we have chosen the silver nanoparticle decoration inside the imbusopo. And as shown here, internal surfaces of the inverse of structure is perfectly decorated with reactive, catalytically reactive silver nanoparticle. And as a model system, we try to convert the four nitrophenol species to the four aminophenol species, which perfectly works. And it shows that 99.9% .9 conversion while retaining very high permeability. So, to summarize, uh, and say some innovative method for making next generation high performance membrane, uh, we have derived these kinds of the multi scale architecture and strategies here as a basic structures of the input superstructure. And utilizing this input superstructure, we incorporate a secondary engineering, secondary nanostructure which is nicely working for a various nanofiltration and ultrafiltration uh, the application. And we hope that these kinds of the basic approaches will be applicable to developing a next generation high performance membrane. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. I have a question about the, the area of the inverse opals. What's the largest crack-free, you know, defect-free area that you were able to obtain? Yeah, this is a very good point. Actually, there was a numerous report on the inverse opal, but the rare cases for the membrane application. The main reason is that they're controlling the uh, major crack. In our cases, we have chosen the UV curable polymer, which is quite flexible while maintaining a good mechanical rigidity, rigidity. So there's no restrictions for the, uh, the scaling up. Actually, we can make uh, some kinds of the, uh, uh, this, the palm size is a membrane just within a 13 million. So this is quite robust and scalable. So we overcome the issues for uh, that kinds of the crack generations for the imbecile. My best colleague. Very good. Thank you. So it's, a, it's a great pleasure actually here in the World Paradise. Thank you. All right. Sorry. <laughs> All right, good to go. Uh, so uh, it's a real pleasure, especially here in the uh, uh, World Perry House, one of the crown jewels that has been added to the collection here at Penn to welcome our distinguished guest. Um, this it was the vision of Richard Perry and uh, Lisa that actually brought me here to about 12 years ago to Penn. But I think the opportunity to welcome one of the newest members of the family as a, a global fellow here at the World Perry House. Um, the uh, opportunity to connect uh, science and policy and to influence the course of decision making is one of the critical things that we've seen throughout some of the presentations today. And so Elizabeth Sherwood Randall has had an absolutely stellar career. 
Um, in all metrics that we think of, she began her career at, as a student at Harvard, graduating magna cum laude, going on to do her uh, doctoral work at Oxford with a Rhodes Scholarship. You know, in the, in the, in, uh, she is one of us in terms of the, uh, the idea of, of academia being uh, part of the launching pad for careers. But she took her skills and her drive and her interest, and she turned it to a whole series of incredibly hard problems. She spent her career working on uh, the, some of the greatest challenges that our uh, society faces in addressing uh, nuclear proliferation issues, uh, trying to uh, struggle with uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, uh, proliferation, and now also influencing major decisions in the area of, of uh, climate change and climate sustainability. So uh, she is also a fellow at Georgia Tech in, uh, in, the, Sam, in the Nunn uh, School and also holds a position at Harvard. So she's a busy, busy lady. Um, but in areas that also impact what we do, she has provided her insight and, and guidance through her roles in the Department of Energy as an undersecretary for energy and has been advisor to the National Laboratory System and other infrastructure that really is one of the engines of, of scientific creativity and effectiveness for the country. So it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to share some of your ideas and a conversation on science and policy, please. Thank you for the excessive introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Are you joining me up here? Oh, I'm You're sorry. They changed the furniture. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I wasn't sure. I, as I was so focused on, on this part, I wasn't noticing the, uh, the stage work. So we'll set this down. Thanks. Ah. So this is an opportunity that we rarely have, actually, as a community, to think about how we can uh, tap in to expertise that goes across all dimensions of how decisions and, and uh, how our country and even global uh, uh, sort of trajectories are influenced. And so one of the questions that I guess is on our mind is um, within the government, within the United States government, um, what is the organization or the committee or the community that is uh, sort of charged with looking at the intersection of science, technology, and, and climate? Um, First, may I thank you oh. for the warm welcome and to the phenomenal REACT team who inspired me when I came for my first week at Perry World House in October. Dayan, Zara, where is Zara? There she is. And Russ, you weren't there, but us also. Um, and Kristen, and the students who participated in the discussion and who described to me their effort to take their basic research and make it relevant to some of the most difficult challenges we face. And because I had uh, led an effort while I was the Deputy Secretary at the Department of Energy to significantly raise our gain in terms of our resilience to the pernicious effects of climate change, I was immediately drawn to this work that you're doing because it has such important implications. So when you asked me if I could come back in early January, I said yes. I wanted to be here and, and learn from those who are actually doing the pioneering work. We listened to you and, and others, and I was able to experience some of the posters and, and try to contribute to the advancement of your efforts. So my experience in the uh, federal landscape ended on January 20th, 2017. And I can describe to you how the system worked uh, in another era. <laughs> Feels like another planet at this point. Uh, when we had the kind of leadership that Mark called for, I would say that I never saw President Obama panic. However, he understood the urgency of this issue and mobilized the full strength of the federal government, in addition to working with uh, our partners around the world to advance our climate agenda and to pursue a clean energy future. So I'll describe to you what, what I knew, but it doesn't necessarily obtain today. 
So there was leadership from the White House, first of all, and I think that's crucially important because the federal government, like the University of Pennsylvania, is a, a vast and dispersed enterprise. You said you have 12 schools on campus. Well, you can think of all the agencies of government, but they are little empires in and of themselves. And what you have to have is a president who says, we're going to use all of the arrows in our quiver, all of the tools in our toolbox to tackle this problem. And so you have leadership by the president, leadership by the National Security Council and the Economic Council, which are located in the White House, and importantly, a leader who is the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, situated also on the White House grounds, to bring together all those who are relevant to advancing the effort. So that includes, you noted, the Energy Department. It, that means you have to put people at the top of your agencies and in key roles in your agencies who care about the agenda and who are knowledgeable. So the Energy Department, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, those are obvious players. The National Science Foundation, which isn't usually at the table in the interagency discussions at the White House, but which obviously contributes significantly to uh, supporting these endeavors. But then there are lots of agencies you wouldn't think of who play. The Commerce Department has a hugely important role to play. NIST is located in the Commerce Department. NOAA is located in the, clim in the Commerce Department. The Defense Department has an enormous role to play. Other agencies across the government are going to be key actors and also will drive change because of the initiatives they can pursue. So I'll, I noted the Defense Department. We wanted to use the Defense Department as a test bed for our efforts to advance clean energy solutions because they're the biggest emitter in the federal government. And also they need less uh, costly solutions to their energy requirements. And when I say they need less costly solutions, costly in terms of funds, but also costly in terms of lives, because the need to get energy to remote locations to support our warfighters can also put our warfighters at great risk. So the Department of Defense, which would surprise people, was an enormously important partner. And of course, they have also foreseen that climate effects will have significant impacts on the calls on our military to respond to crises around the world. So it was a full team effort uh, in the Obama administration. And as I began by saying, it involved the crucial aspect of collaboration with our allies and our partners around the world. And there, uh, we saw some of the slides uh, that Mark uh, showed uh, regarding the emissions of China and the United States and others. And you noted uh, this, this um, a challenge that for the developing world, uh, how do you deny people access to energy when they need it um, uh, in order to meet your climate goals? We had to tackle that head on because we knew that for countries that are still on a steep development uh, trajectory and in a country like India, for example, where 300 million people don't have access to electricity, the only way to partner with the Indian government was to be in their shoes, to sit, put ourselves in, in their position and to acknowledge that in order to move them toward a clean energy future, we had to answer the challenges they face as leaders of their own people. And if that didn't involve getting energy to those who need it in a way that was cleaner for all of us, we would fail. And the play with China was a different play, of course, and we can talk about that more. But importantly, we can never get to where we need to go alone. We have to do it in collaboration with all of, all of those in the world who are participating in the global economy. And I would just make a last point um, in response to what, what you've asked and what I heard Mark say, because when I came into my role at the Energy Department, I hoped I would have some silver bullet solution that would address these challenges. And the reality is there's no silver bullet to addressing our climate challenges. It is going to require so many simultaneous diverse solutions to meet those those, the, the challenges of the slides you presented, Mark. And so what I say to people is pick the piece you want to work on and run as hard and fast at the, the challenge as you can and, and bring solutions forward because we're going to need multiple solutions. You mentioned efficiency, Mark. We're going to need solutions in, in the ways in which you're working. We're going to need solutions for generation of energy that, that we don't yet know how to do. Um, and so there are multiple aspects of this that involve the science and technology base in our countries, the country here, the countries of our French and 
Korean colleagues and others who are participating in this conversation. I think there, there's huge opportunity for innovation, uh, which the federal government also needs to continue to support. And of course, in this current time, we're seeing a huge retrenchment in that kind of support, um, which is necessary to, to advance the goals that we all share. So tremendous uh, challenges, but in that opportunity, I mean, I think your comment about the call to arms um, and to rush towards those challenges, um, are there some thoughts that you would have as to how students and faculty, how, you know, how we can play a part in mobilizing? Because one of the things that I think we heard was the fact that in society more generally, we're, we're a rather secluded group sometimes, maybe to our detriment, um, but how, uh, how would you encourage us to help to mobilize uh, beyond our boundaries and really uh, you know, get the kind of momentum that's needed in this So for space. the students whose posters I approached with trepidation, because as you, you didn't describe what I got my degree in, and it's not, it's not hard science. It's not, not physical science, not biological science. It's soft science. So um, the first thing you have to do as a scientist, I think, is, is learn to answer the question, if you want to play in this space, yeah. in the policy space, why does this matter? And I asked each of the students I engaged, can you speak to me in a way that I can understand why does this contribute to the advancement of our clean energy future and meeting our climate challenge? Because scientists don't naturally skew toward that, by and large. And we have a big translational problem, which is that we're not, we talked about this briefly earlier, why is it that people don't believe that climate change is real? Well, part of it is that there's been intentional obfuscation of the science by people who oppose the agenda, but also because it's hard to understand some of this stuff. And so I would say one thing that scientists can do is learn to speak in a way that, that I would say, because my mother wasn't a scientist, that your mother could understand, but some of you have mothers who are scientists, so that would not apply to you. But to whomever you can put on your list of someone who doesn't speak your language, but who needs to understand what you're doing. So that's one thing you can do. Two is I think you can be a part of a community like this, which is endeavoring explicitly to be cross-disciplinary, to bring together all the people around Penn, whether it's the Kleinman Center, the people at Perry World House, people doing all of this phenomenal science in the labs around Penn, involving people from the Wharton School who will think about the private sector dimension and the imperative of rapid deployment of solutions that are working, bringing them to market quickly. All of that, that ecosystem is vital to achieving our goals. And I think there, truly, if you think about the, the innovation chain, is how I would describe it, from the basic science that some of you are doing to applied science that you're working on, to the testing and development of solutions where you experience failure and you'll have your first approach to maybe a startup and it may work and it may not and there's the whole question of how you get sufficient funding. We had the Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy which we launched to try to help bring solutions to market. Interestingly, Congress has continued to fund that in spite of the um, Trump administration's effort to zero out the budget for ARPA-E. Uh, then from that early deployment and adjustment of the technology, if need be, is the broader effort to push out these solutions quickly, which is necessary. And that whole innovation chain has to be vibrant. It has to be moving. And so you pick your place on it, but you need to know who's to your right and to your left, and you need to work with them because it's, it's like a relay race almost. We've got to get every piece of the race going effectively if we're going to get where we need to go. I think that, that comment about communication is so important. And unfortunately, I don't think we yet have someone in this generation that is the Carl Sagan that makes difficult concepts exciting and accessible. Uh, we, we need people at all levels that are going to help with that piece. I, I think the part that you also zeroed in on is this idea about, you know, mixing of experiences and the interdisciplinary nature. And I think, you know, I wish every economist had to take a few science courses and every scientist should take a few economics courses and a few uh, things that provide bridges because we all have to be based in, in uh, a, a sober assessment of reality, right, in terms of, uh, of, of the choices that we make. And another thing, I mean, for students who are here, junior faculty, even senior faculty, um, seeking out an opportunity to serve, 
whether it's locally, um, go to work for your mayor, if, that's a, if it's one of the mayors who is committed to the climate cities endeavor, go to work for a governor. The governor of New Jersey next door is, is a new governor, relatively new governor, has a hugely ambitious energy agenda, Phil Murphy. Go to work for the federal government. Right now, that may be challenging, but keep your eye, on, start somewhere. Keep your eye on the horizon. Uh, but seriously, I think one of the things that can be extremely useful is to have an opportunity to go in for a couple of years and see what it's like to make policy. It's often said, if you knew how policy was made, it's like sausage, you wouldn't want to eat it. Um, uh, policy makers function in a world of numerous constraints. They don't work in a clean and perfect lab. And so uh, it's, I think it's quite valuable because you see when you work in the policy world for a little while what it takes to get something implemented, and it helps you to be more effective then in, in, in trying to sell your idea when you go back into your academic setting. When I, when I was doing my doctoral research um, at Oxford, I told my supervisor that I wanted to go to Washington to test my thesis in the real world. And he told me that he was finished with me as a scholar, that I would, I would dirty my hands in the real world, and then I could never have the objectivity <laughs> necessary to be an academic. And I, I looked at him, I was just completely stunned, and I thought, how can I write a responsible thesis if I don't actually ask the question, does this work in reality? And so I did go off, and I, without his blessing, I went and tested my ideas, and I did finish the dissertation. I ultimately earned his vote of support, but it was quite a struggle. And I think that's one of the tensions is that sometimes in academia, it's not as well respected as it should be. And I think you want to find a, a group that you can work with where that is encouraged. And you, if your junior faculty and your school doesn't give you the flexibility to go and, and, and do something that involves you in the policy world, you need to band together with other junior faculty and say, you know, in this generation, we really want to be involved in, in the issues of our times, and you need to give us the opportunity and, and incentivize that. So I think that's fascinating advice. And actually, it's interesting as a scientist to see the parallel, because that discouragement that you experienced and overcame is something that I think as a, as a community in science, we have to yes. really make some changes. Because the idea that we train scientists and they go off in other directions somehow is viewed as a loss often yes. within yes. our discipline. And now the world has woken up to the fact that some of the best financial minds in the world are trained as engineers, right? And we need to make that transition, I think, where, you know, I think it's a, if we could educate more politicians and social scientists and folks that are going to be filling all different roles in, in our country, but globally, um, with the skills and the analytical insight and the rigor yes. that comes from part of the scientific training, we should make that a priority. It's about scientific literacy more than it is about producing more scientists, I think, at the lower levels. And that's actually an interesting point as you're thinking about curriculum here at Penn. I mean, one of the things that happens if you're a person who's a social scientist is you're scared off of the hard science courses because you think you will fail at them. If the courses could be designed so that it, it, you were really trying to teach how you think through scientific problems and you conceptualized in a way that would relate to people who do not have the same, for example, quantitative skills that you have, you might effectively train that next generation on the political science side. Um, I, I would say that my observation in most universities which have distribution requirements is that for the social scientists, the hard science distribution requirements are a joke. They don't take them seriously. And it's, it can be vice versa, too. Right. And actually, we want to have, as you just said, People who are literate, who come to the table, so for example, at the table in the Situation Room at the White House, what I observed was I would have benefited from having a much deeper knowledge of science. I wish that I had had more training, and I had to rely on people who I could bring with me to offer that insight. But in the next generation of science and technology is going to be so much more at the forefront of every policy decision we have to make. It will, our future will actually depend on whether we have literate people at that table who, who have combined the capabilities we're describing. Right. So one of the parts, I wonder if it might be part of the solution, but as you say, things that are hard for certain of the social science students to, um, and might be intimidating in terms of engaging, mm -hmm. there actually are many skills that our scientists would be challenged by. Absolutely. And so a course that was designed so that it had challenging elements from both sides that was an equalizer 
in terms of how things would be evaluated and how they might uh, move forward. Actually, that, that could be something that institutions like Penn have an opportunity to, to rethink. What, what do we have as part of our core That's uh, a curriculum. super interesting idea, which is actually to bring the two together into a course rather than doing the, 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 hard, the um, pseudoscience for the soft scientists right. and the whatever the liberal arts thing is that you're trying to do for the scientists. And I have two young scientists in my family, and I will say that uh, when I listen to them describe what they are choosing in order to get through the requirements on the non-science side, I don't feel satisfied by that. I think it should not just be trying to do the bare minimum. It should actually be being in an environment in which you are cultivated to be effective, for example, in communication. Have you learned to write in a way that a grant reviewer can actually understand right. your explanation of why your proposal matters? Why should the NSF fund you? Uh, so it's an interesting challenge to see if you could bring people together across the disciplinary divide and design a course that would be effective and then test it for a couple of years and see what the outcome is. Do you think uh, maybe one more question, then we'll go to the audience to get uh, people involved. But uh, do you think that, um, uh, or maybe, what do you think we need to do in order to focus on climate and environmental security, and even using that, that term, security, um, in a way that would start to turn the tide. Mm -hmm. There should be some natural uh, alliance with communities that think about strength and resilience as a national imperative, and those that think about the enduring resource that is the earth. And yet, at the moment, those seem to be almost uh, orthogonal. Um, do you th what are your thoughts about, about the uh, ability to bring climate and environmental security into, into focus? You know, I think that the private sector has an enormously important role to play because our private sector is on the front line of uh, what is happening in our world and, and is increasingly cognizant of the fact that ignoring climate comes at the peril of their bottom line. Right. And so one of the important partners, and you all are working with Salve, obviously, in this project, and I think the private sector has a voice uh, that can be very effective in speaking truth to power. Uh, and so it needs to be mobilized uh, on this agenda. And indeed, we've seen a number of companies take leadership roles uh, and more need to do so. Second, I would say that people, we are beginning to see some shift um, when you look at Congress. I mean, President Obama had an extremely difficult time with Congress in the first term on trying to get through uh, any kind of uh, um, cap and trade or carbon tax and finally decided not to try to push it through. Um, and uh, what we're seeing increasingly because of what is happening in communities around our country, if we speak only about the United States, is that the uh, climate change effects are so significant, as was described earlier, from Florida to California, Texas, I mean, all over our country, different communities are experiencing these extreme weather events. Uh, eventually, the call will be on legislators uh, to, act, to call for change and to act for change. And so I think one of the developments that will be helpful to us will be that we have a Congress that is more committed to holding the executive accountable if the executive is avoiding that accountability as we are currently seeing. And finally, I would say that the, the threat issue is significant enough. And I think if you look at the report that the Pentagon put out actually in this administration, uh, but it was, it was uh, uh, in 2017 on the uh, challenges just to the infrastructure of the Department of Defense uh, of climate effects. Uh, that says to you that there's going to be a growing uh, perception of the vital nature of this threat. That is, it's existential. And so I think that we will be able to reach those who have been uh, skeptical for other reasons when they begin to see the uh, risks that we face uh, from our own security. And that will be useful also in addressing, uh, in, in reaching some of the skeptics. So I'm hopeful, but I'll also add that I think Mark's concern about timing is a very legitimate one. We don't have the time to 
uh, waste that is being wasted. And in fact, going in reverse in these years is, is devastating. The slide you showed about 2017 and beyond in terms of, of all of the, the release of the pressure that we had generated. Um, our own changes with our clean, the uh, clean power rules, the, the uh, air quality standards, the emissions uh, standards for vehicles, you name it. It's across the board here that everything is being, is being loosened and at the same time not using American leadership uh, to mobilize others to, to do everything they can to meet these challenges uh, means that we will not get anywhere near even what we set as our goals for Paris, which were admittedly insufficient. And there's an interview with Obama in, the, in Rolling Stone magazine in August of, of um, his last year in office, it was 2016, in which he acknowledged that the Paris agreements were, were uh, unequal to the challenge but a necessary way station, never imagining that we would be going in reverse. Uh, and so that's, that, that, whole, that puts us all obviously in, in severe danger. Um, and we need to, all, to do all that we can to change that direction, reverse the direction that has been reversed, and, and then go farther and faster than we anticipated. Yeah, I think that point about you know, the, how much harder it gets as we delay the implementation Correct. is one thing that, uh, even among the scientific community, I don't think it's fully appreciated outside of the experts in that, in and, that piece. And, and here I'll say that the, I, I want to close on a positive point. I mean, it's negative in the sense that it's because we have not done enough, but your group is focused, the REACT group is focused on mitigation. Um, and I don't like the fact that we now have to invest so much more in climate mitigation, that it's, a, that it's an acknowledged reality that we are, we are facing these pernicious effects of climate change. And therefore, there's a lot that we're going to have to do as communities to prepare ourselves. But it is the reality. We shouldn't relinquish the goal of reversing climate change. But in the meantime, our communities are experiencing catastrophic events. I mean, I'm a Californian, and, and what's happened in our state in the last two years is just staggering. And the major utility, the largest utility in the state, is, is collapsing. The CEO quit yesterday. We've learned today that they're filing for bankruptcy. They absolutely cannot get out from under the liability of the most recent uh, series of fires. And that's, that's not normal, but it is now the new normal. And so uh, those who are working on mitigation will have, I think, major opportunities to have an impact, uh, but that should not be the only thing we're working on. We should also be working on, on the solutions we need to find for the future uh, to uh, meet the planet's energy needs without destroying it. So do you think that in, in one of the parts that you mentioned, about sort of trying to figure, well, it's an issue of prioritization. Yes. Um, but if you want to make uh, sort of a, a, an opportunity in a very adversarial political environment, yes. do you think it, you might advise, or would, is it possible to prioritize some of the initiatives that specifically speak to environmental stability, if you think about the Department of Defense, for example, mm -hmm. to, to strongly support those efforts which both strengthen readiness and and the security issues, but also address the themes that you mentioned in terms of fuel security and and bases that are under threat from sea level rise and so on. Should should there be a discussion ab about how to raise the profile and focus resources on those issues, which seem at least to do less they harm? They seem potentially less politicized. I don't know. I mean, I I think that scientists should not self-censor when they have evidence that needs to be provided to the world. And so trying to play politics right now and, and choose what you work toward because of the attitude of the current administration seems inconsistent with who you are. Now, if you are in a situation where you have, uh, uh, have to choose who you're going to try to influence, and you see a real target of opportunity to widely deploy some new technology, it could be that you would say, let's go work with the Department of Defense right now. They're more receptive. But I think in these times, it's actually quite important that we ensure, and this is something you and I have talked about, Chris, that we ensure scientific integrity. 
the fact that there is an assault on science, uh, which we could never have imagined happening in this country, requires that all of us stand up to it and advocate for the hearing of the truth and the airing of the truth, the promulgation of the truth, because that's who we are. And, and it's actually, I consider it to be fundamentally anti-American, un-American, to squish, to squash the truth, the scientific truth. So we, have, we, we, we face a, an unprecedented challenge right now, and, and it's on all of us to, to respond to that. I think that's a pretty powerful call to arms. Um, we have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Tell me who you are when you ask a question, if you Please. have a question. Uh, hello, thank you so much for your discussion. My name is Sathya Adamadaka, and I'm an intern in Zara's group. So I wanted to tr perhaps tie in your perspective at sort of the vantage point of humanitarian uh, policy making mm -hmm. and Mr. Hughes' perspective at the call to arms. And sort of in the past, in World War II, the wartime mobilization by the government that was sort of necessary for enacting change. So back then, the government was at sort of, like I said, leading the change that needed to be made. But now, with climate change, it's sort of a more complex problem. We have the interplay of academia, the industry, and the government. So when time comes, when we're, we need to perhaps to deploy uh, a product that needs to save the world, how do you see the three interacting? And could you maybe state the optimal uh, sort of combination between the three and the actual reality that might play out? So the optimal combination, I think, would be you have a federal government that has a priority for addressing climate and deploying clean energy solutions. It has an investment strategy to stimulate the kind of uh, fundamental research and applied research and development and deployment that would lead to rapidly bringing to market those solutions. It supports the whole ecosystem that is necessary to that, so that's work of great universities, work of national laboratories in partnership with universities, and work with the private sector. That all, those three need to come together to uh, do this, to, to undertake this endeavor. And then it would create uh, the kind of support that would be necessary to help to um, help the smallest and most vulnerable sprouts of innovation mature when the market isn't ready to invest in them. And that's a really critical issue, and it's one of the reasons I mentioned ARPA-E, but I'll give you another example of this. Um, the Department of Energy in the uh, early years of the Obama administration funded uh, with loan money that was ultimately repaid to the federal government um, five of the, the, the first five utility scale solar projects in the United States because the private sector wasn't yet willing to put its money behind utility scale solar. And with those proving themselves to be viable propositions, there, the US government was repaid and now there are more than 50 utility scale solar plants in this country all supported by the private sector. So the point is I see the government's role as being one of supporting innovation and identifying where there are uh, uh, spaces in which absent federal funding, it may not be possible to get where we need to go. But ultimately, the federal government needs to get out of the way and let the private sector take over. So that would be the ideal situation, that, that description of the strengthening of the ecosystem. The real situation right now is there are a lot of things that are not working. And uh, although um, in some cases I mentioned ARPA-E and others, the, uh, in addition, some of the programs the Department of Energy focused on, on clean energy innovation were uh, the budgets proposed by the Trump administration were slashed. Uh, the Congress put money back in, and now that money is just being sat on within the department. It's not being dispersed. So that is a way of actually defying the intent of Congress, and that's an issue for Congress to take up because that's not the way the system is supposed to work. But we do have a break right now, and so there I would say to you, if you're interested in trying to uh, stimulate solutions, I would be looking for ways to mobilize universities, uh, working with national uh, labs that are still able to secure funding because their funding is not um, only from the Department of Energy. Uh, 
working with the private sector, importantly, uh, to collaborate, and you're doing that in some of your endeavors already here, and uh, taking advantage of the groundswell of public opinion, especially among the younger generation, which is highly mobilized on this issue. And that's something that didn't exist during the Second World War, as you were describing, is the power of social media, the power of the networks that have been created to rally people to a cause. And so that's a new power tool that can be used to link people who otherwise would not have known that they shared the same goals and bring about change when change is not being led from the top down. Very thoughtful, actually, that especially uh, what, what tools may be at our disposal to change the pace of society's uh, response. Other questions? Yes, we have a question over here. Hi, my name is Emily. I am a fourth year PhD student in Dr. Riggleman's lab. I'm part of the REACT program. Um, I have a quick question about how do you think is a, um, what do you think is a useful way that we can do to stress the urgency that we face? Because all of us have the status quo mentality and people are prone to just stay where they are, be the boiling frog. But what is a way that we can keep this momentum going without having natural disasters hit us? So I think some of the work that we talked about earlier on the uh, challenge of figuring out how to explain why you work on what you work on uh, in a way that can be understood by those who don't speak your scientific language. That's really translational work in a sense. And it's, it's looking for opportunities to describe your research to a broader audience uh, looking for opportunities to place articles in non-academic journals, mm. looking for opportunities to speak in places where everyone wouldn't be like you, uh, and and finding uh, platforms where you can you can participate in a discussion that gives you a chance to say, based on what I know, because this is my foundational knowledge, I assess that this is urgent, and there are people working on solutions. And here's an example of some, and we need to uh, work to advance together to meet the challenges the planet faces. I think you can't stay in your, in your lab quietly only working if you feel this sense of urgency. Now, it's also very important that we have people doing this lab work, so I'm not suggesting that you walk away from it or get so distracted that you don't complete the effort, but I think it's about being multidimensional. And, 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 and identifying opportunities to participate in the larger debate and use that knowledge that others don't have to help inform them. Good. One more question right here. I already have a microphone, so that worked well. Um, I'm Katie. I am a third year PhD student, also in the REACT program under Russ Composto and Dan Lee. Um, so I guess my question resol or revolves kind of around legislation and policymakers. So we have this group of policymakers in which, for example, the House Committee on Science and Technology is objectively a mess um, with no scientists in it. Um, so I guess my question is, how do we train scientists and healthcare providers to, one, have the skills to go into something like politics, and two, um, how do we get them to go there? Because it seems that these sorts of legislative bodies are difficult to penetrate into unless you have this political background, except for maybe the presidency. Well, look, I mean, I'll say two, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say two things to you. One is, that, one is that I think you look at the new Congress, the House. There are a lot of people in that House who have no profile that would have suggested to you they would have been a politician, except they were mobilized by their outrage in the last two years, and they decided to put themselves forward. And that should give you hope that, that if, you're, if this matters to you, that there's a place for you to participate in the political process. Our government at the federal, state, and local level is only as good as we make it. And that's true of our international institutions, by the way, also. I mean, we have to step forward to serve if we want them to be the best. Uh, the second thing is I wouldn't write off the people who aren't scientists who are on committees. So I'll give you an example from my experience because it, it really was a powerful lesson to me. The Secretary of Energy who I served was Ernie Moniz, a nuclear physicist who was on the MIT faculty for 39 years. You had an office near him, you mentioned. Right. Um, and um, Ernie is a completely brilliant, terrifyingly brilliant human being, generative, creative, 
bold, and he would easily be intimidating to a member of Congress because he's just, just his brain is so large. In the summer of 2015, uh, we had a big challenge we faced, which was we had just completed the negotiations of the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, President Obama had sent Secretary Moniz to sit alongside Secretary Kerry at the negotiations with the Iranians alongside our allies and the Russians and the Chinese in reaching this agreement because President Obama wanted to make, make sure that the uh, science and technology of the agreement that we were uh, building was, was absolutely sound from a proliferation perspective, that what we were agreeing to would genuinely stop the Iranian nuclear program and we could have confidence in it. So that summer of 2015, after the agreement was reached, we needed to persuade Congress not to obstruct implementation. And there were numerous members of Congress who knew nothing about the details of a, how you would take apart a plutonium reactor and make it, uh, make it irreverse, make, make the taking apart um, irreversible so that it could not generate defense grade plutonium. Or how you would take apart centrifuges and ensure that they could not then be used for pernicious purposes in enriching uranium. So we began a series of meetings with members of Congress in the summer of 2015 in Ernie's office. And we met in small groups. We usually had dinners together. And uh, Ernie opened himself up to questions from these members who didn't have a science background and answered them in the most genuine thoughtful and respectful way, not at all condescending, not at all humiliating, giving them the tools they needed to defend the agreement, to explain it in a way that a person who was not a nuclear physicist could understand. And I watched that with awe because I thought many people would have been so annoyed at having to explain this over and over and over again, but he took it as an opportunity to empower people to do the right thing. And I think there the thing you have to consider is if so our committees aren't made up of people who are sufficiently trained, but you can go and help them. You can go and be a staff member on the committee. You can go and testify before the committee. You can write articles, as we were describing, which can be circulated to the committees. And we have to perform that educational function to help people to learn. That's the nature of our democracy. And I do think that that example will always stick with me because it was a real lesson that um, you can be as... as um, brainy as, as Ernie and come down to earth, I really come down to earth and speak to people in a way that's very effective. Oh, maybe one, one other part is the successes that we do have. So well, I think many in this crowd might know, but Angela Merkel was a PhD, Absolutely. physical chemist, chemical physicist, perhaps one of the most influential women in politics and certainly in this generation. But uh, so people make that, that transition. But I want to add something about Angela Merkel, actually. Excuse me for interrupting oh, you. But, um, so I observed her in action up close with, with President Obama because in my first role in the administration, I was responsible for our relationship with Europe from 2009 to 2013. And um, so I met many times with when President Obama met with Chancellor Merkel. And of course, President Obama was trained as a lawyer. And Chancellor Merkel, as you said, is a scientist. And what was really extraordinary was how uh, they spoke to each other. Um, and that training you described of the way that science teaches you to think, the rigor with which you approach problems, matched perfectly with Obama's extremely rigorous <laughs> legal mind. And the two of them were both also deep humanitarians uh, she, from her personal experience of growing up in, in Germany, East yeah. Germany, and he from his life story, which most people here obviously would know, um, uh, from, from how much it's been talked about. And so the two of them came together with these fine, rigorous minds and a deep humanity. And I was so uh, struck by how effective Angela Merkel was in thinking through problems uh, and being strategic about tackling them because of that background that she had in science. So I just want to add that because you have been, you articulated this point that this scientific training is quite useful to people in potentially in leadership roles. Thank you. Maybe one last question here. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Neha, and I work with Dayan and Kate. My name is Neha, and I work with Dayan and Kate as one of the reactors. Um, and my question is about um, how higher and this program has really leveraged some um, international collaboration. Yes. A lot of what was mentioned already today is that this is really a global challenge. 
and we need to tackle it with a lot of help from people outside of the U.S. community. Um, so are there other opportunities in higher that are strongly encouraging um, academics and industry to kind of foster these international collaborations and we share expertise? And um, do you think it should be coming from us that we should push for more of these opportunities? Or is it something that is already there but we are not taking, um, using them as, as we should be? I probably can't answer that comprehensively. I'll say that in, in the prior administration, we, as I noted, we heavily emphasized the imperative of collaboration with other countries. And, and that included supporting scientific collaboration. So there was policy collaboration, but there, all, there was also a big investment. For example, I was in the Republic of Korea to talk with scientists and, and um, uh, members of, of universities about the potential for advancing our clean energy goals. Uh, ditto in, in allied countries in Europe with the European Union as well as with individual countries and frankly all around the world. That work uh, that has been directed by the federal government is, at least from the energy department, currently not being advanced. So I would say this puts more of a burden on uh, the academy and on the, uh, on the private sector to seek out the opportunities for collaboration and seek funding, if not from uh, the federal government, then from philanthropy. Uh, where there is a mobilization also of effort. I haven't mentioned philanthropy thus far, but philanthropy is trying to step into the breach uh, on, on some of, on climate issues. And so I think you do need to do more proactive work than you might have had to do a couple of years ago to create these opportunities for collaboration. Uh, but my understanding of the way scientists love to work is really to be without borders and boundaries and to find the best minds who are working all around the world to share your ideas with and cross-fertilize. And so I would think this would be something that would come naturally to you. Thank you. Russ is standing up. He's about to give uh, us the probably hug, means we need to keep our schedule. So. <laughs> Thank you all Thank so you. much. Thank you. Very, thank you. And <laughs> Uh, first of all, our, our REACT meeting three years ago was about basic science. We talked about display technologies. Uh, last year, we brought in shelter box to show us about how natural disasters are really being dealt with. And then this year, our organizing committee, uh, which is uh, Dayun Lee, Kristen Field, Rob Riegelman, and Zara Fakra, suggested we talk about policy and technology. So things that are really out of our comfort zone. So I think they made a good choice, particularly for the University of Pennsylvania. So I just want to spend a few more minutes thanking the people who made this possible. First of all, Salve, uh, who's been our sponsor for the past three years. And particularly, I want to point out uh, Denis uh, Bendijak is here uh, to represent Salve. So thank you very much for your continued support. Uh, Amy Gadsden could not make it. I think she is in China right now. But she was really the person who put us in touch with Liz and Perry Worldhouse uh, and really was behind the scenes at Penn Global to make this happen. So I want to thank Amy, even though she's not here. And I also want to thank all the folks at the Perry Worldhouse. They are supporting the reception uh, that will take place uh, right after this. And they've been a fantastic group to work with. Uh, most importantly, I want to thank our speakers. I, I hope you were all inspired uh, to go on and do great things and, and think about the gaps between technology, policy, and basic science. So I think uh, the speakers and the moderators did a phenomenal job, and I want to thank them very much. So give them a hand. Our French partners from Grenoble have been our uh, tried and true partners for many years. Uh, we have a growing relationship, and I want to thank you, and our budding relationship with our uh, new friends from South Korea. Uh, so thank you both for giving us an international perspective of what REACT is about. Um, most importantly, secondly, 
Uh, the symposium would not be possible without uh, the efforts of Dr. Kristen Fields. Uh, she's the Director of Education and Professional Development, and she actually mentors all of our students to give public presentations to a general audience. So exactly what was being talked about, yeah, uh, Kristen is already training our students to do. And uh, really, without her glue, uh, she is indeed the special sauce that makes uh, React possible. So let's thank Kristen. And finally, thank you all for attending. I hope this symposium has motivated you to think about climate change, natural disasters, the role of science and policy in, in new and different ways. So now we've concluded, and I hope you can stay around and, and chat with other interested parties at the reception. So thank you. <laughs>